Oh no, I messed it up. It's it's three, two. Hey, <laughs> welcome to another episode of Pizza Punk. My name tonight is Betty, and this right here is Teebs. I love it. I just got that just now. I just got it. Wow. I, I, I man, man, oh man, oh man. <laughs> I, uh, I'm I'm getting uh, slow in my old age. Uh, I got mm-hmm. Tracy Bird, aka TV Monstrosity. In in the pizza parlor. Welcome, Tracy. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. What's up, everybody? What's I unfortunately don't have any pizza with me tonight. So you know, I when I first the very first episode I did with uh, Paris from the Crow Mags, and we both ate pizza together, and it was really fun. But that's really hard to keep up, especially with the frequency of the show. So you know, you can't. You can't do do cut, do pizza. cut to like a year later of you doing shows eating pizza every Wednesday every Thursday and you're like I'm gaining a hundred pounds this year you know? <laughs> and and you know it's funny too and I know that we we could talk about this a little bit I know that you like me are sort of like you know doing uh, trying to cut down on like meat and dairy consumption and so you know I, I guess you could do some of that nut cheese. <laughs> You know the go the nut cheese route. Dave, Dave, Davey's a big fan, from what I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. You saw you saw that. I did. Dude, I did. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. I have not laughed so. That was so funny. <laughs> that whole exchange was hilarious, man. Oh, that was uh, awesome. That was awesome. Um, tonight so tonight's episode is sponsored by White Peach Ginger Bubbly, and so we have that on standby and. Listen, let's dive right into the pizza since we're talking pizza. I, I have sure, a thesis sure. question. I have to ask this to every one of my guests. So the thesis question. All right. I'm going right. to pull in a little closer to this, get a little intimate here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the uh, And it might be followed up by a question of, of heated controversy, but I think we got to we'll put this to rest. <laughs> I think I know where this is going. You know, he knows where this is going. He knows where <laughs> this is going. Um, Tracy. Is pizza punk? And if it is punk, why? And if it's not punk, why not? And every answer is subjective. So don't feel any pressure. Okay. Um, it's pizza punk. Yes. And reason being, reason being is because, you know, unlike today where there are many, 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 AKA, I guess you would liken them to mainstream music, mainstream record labels, et cetera, et cetera. When pizza began, when pizza was invented, it was just, you know, all these mom and pop shops in Italy. And, you know, they were just doing it because they, they, they invented it guys. Like, um, and there was no, there was no crass commercialism. There was no, um, it was very grassroots. It was very grassroots and they did their own thing. And the pizzas that they made in Italy, when it first began, we took, and well, more, 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 more. They brought them here, and we kind of put our own spins on them. And then, you know, then pizza became mainstream, much like punk became mainstream in 1994 with Green Day, The Offspring, Rancid, to say that, et cetera, et cetera. So, and you know, and I love, and I love, and I love mainstream punk so you guys can hand me my card right now i don't give a fuck i love that shit so um yeah you know this is where this is where all you punker than now kids turn off the broadcast fuck tv man he showers (laughs) (laughs) but but no um so you know so then you know it becomes commercialized right it becomes americanized becomes bastardized and then you have dominoes and you have little caesars then you have pizza hut Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Uh, so, in that regard, yes, pizza is punk. Um, is it not punk as well? Yes, because there are still the grassroots, independent mom and pop shops doing their own thing, and now they're taking it to more of a to more of a um, more grassroots level in those places because they're adding to the formula that's there. Much like most of the punk rock underground bands that are around now are adding to the formula that's there. You know, they're putting crazy shit like clams on pizza and clam sauce. And, you know, they're making, you know, lo mein pizzas and shrimp pizzas and stuff like that. So so they're taking it they're taking it up a notch. You know what I mean? 
so it's it's still punk you know but then you know by the same token you can still go get your you can still get your five seconds of summer pizza at, down at Domino's or you know uh stuff like that so that that's that's my that's my summation it, it is and it is not it, it is still punk and it is not punk as well much like punk rock itself you know everything you said was good but that last line was the it was the cherry on top of the <laughs> the cake which is sitting on the sunday in yeah. just like that's no one said that yet just like just like punk rock punk is both punk and not punk and I guess in that way, the way that you just described, pizza follows the same sort of pattern. I think so. I think so because again, you still have you still have that independent spirit. You still have mm-hmm. the mom and pop places doing their own thing, creating new new pizzas from the old pizzas they were inspired by, but they're still doing their own thing, and they're they're not corporately owned. They're independently owned. They're DIY, as it were, which falls in line with you know, the punk rock ethos and all that stuff. So yeah, you know, again, it it is punk and it is not as well. I think my, one of the things that's really stuck with me from episode to episode, I forgot who said it. Somebody said it, um, that pizza is three ingredients in the same way that punk is three chords. And that also I thought rang very true. And, you know, you take these three, things and or the you arrange these three things in as long as it's in the proper order that is because i'm going to segue this into uh I, we have to settle this tv it has to be settled i'm bringing a, a topic of great controversy of great animus um of great debate onto the air for a brief moment tb is in this camp um tb <laughs> believes that deep dish Stuffed pizza is pizza, and I am of the belief that it is a casserole. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. I this That's is what I, I want to offer. You. I want to offer you an olive branch. I want to offer, <laughs> let me say this one thing. Let me say this one thing, and I could put put this to rest. I'll never put the Beatles to rest, but I'll put this to rest. Ready? It's this pizza in order for it to remain pizza you just talked about lo mein pizza which by the way sounds phenomenal you talked about clam pizza it's pretty good I, I i would imagine it's pretty good though i would imagine it's phenomenal and <laughs> you know what i don't know did you make that up or you actually heard of that no 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 i've actually there was a um, when i was living in massachusetts there was a pizzeria nearby me that uh, actually did a lo mein pizza so it was the chicken it was a chicken lo mein pizza with like garlic sauce or something like that i bet that's banging I bet, I bet that is awesome. banging. And here's the thing. Those are like, there's also specialty slices, but I think pizza in order to have remain the identity of pizza has to have those three ingredients, cheese, sauce, and dough. And whatever you put on top following those things can still work as pizza. And here's where I'm going to draw the comparison. So stuffed crust, it's pizza-like in the same way a calzone is pizza-like. Right. TV. Also, also Stromboli, yeah. Right, Stromboli. But Tracy, if someone said, "Hey, a Stromboli's pizza," you'd be like, "You're out of your goddamn freaking mind! It's pizza. It's not pizza. It's pizza. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's ad. It's adjacent. It's pizza adjacent. Yeah. Right. So, so what I so what, where I want to leave this is the stuffed deep dish pizza, whatever the hell that is, where they they decided to they were like, "Hey, today's backwards day. Let's put cheese on the bottom and sauce on the top." What the fuck? Like, let's reverse everything. It's like it, it just it doesn't work. It's not, it's pizza adjacent. Okay. Here's my retort. <laughs> and I will keep it civil. Okay. I know, this has been, I know this has been a heated, heated point of discussion for you and I for years. Um yes. I, okay. I, I get what you're saying. Total totally, totally valid, totally valid, totally valid. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. It's pizza simply because, and don't get me wrong, I understand that there are specific, you know, rules that are kind of, you know, like Detroit style pizza. It's square, it's still pizza, you know, um, you know, or you go like anywhere in the world and ask for a bar pie, they give you a square pizza, you know, um, but it's pizza to me because, again, based on your argument, it has sauce, it has cheese, it has dough. Uh, now, it doesn't matter to me 
where you put those ingredients. As long as it is round, which it is, it is round. And it has those three ingredients. It's pizza, brother. Let's all just get along. All right. All right. All right. Uh, we're going to move on, but I want, I'm going to say <laughs> one final thing about this, and it's this. Okay. All right. Tracy is a metalhead, just to the core, a metal friggin' maven. Just dude loves metal. He loves I metal do. so much. I want to ask you, by the way, if you remember that metal shop we went to, but we'll, we'll get to that later. We went to that in, in Germany. Remember that place? It's crazy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, but here's my question. So metal heads in general, I'm going to make a generalized statement. It's not a you statement. This is a generalized statement. Freaking, freaking um, metal heads are incredibly particular about the minutia of their metal. Like you have how many different varieties of metal are there? You have power metal. There's magic metal. There's wizard metal. There's black metal. There's like fuzzy metal. There's, there's polka dot metal. There's like a thousand and one different metals. Now, if man, I feel like if we were lawyers, this would be like the best courtroom drama ever, like arguing over <laughs> the pizza, the pizza case. Um, now, now Tracy pizza gate. The pizza gate, right? Now, oh my god! Um, now, now, Tracy, Tracy, yep. would you, if if this if pizza was metal and someone said, "Oh, power metal is the same as Norwegian black death metal," would you? What would I mean? Would you be like, "Yeah, dude, totally the same. They're both metal. Yeah, totally metal." Or would you be like, "No, no, 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 no." Those are vastly different beasts because <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I, I would I would be the I would be the vastly different beast camp. Only only because only because you know there's there's uh you know there's certain things that make power metal power metal and there that, that black metal doesn't have. There's certain things that Norwegian black metal is made black metal that power metal doesn't have. So you know it's a so it's a it's a it's a uh, um, what's the word? It's a it's a, two very distinct styles that may have very minute things in common here and there, but are not one and the same. Okay, so I rest which my I guess, which I guess just shits all over my argument about the deep dish. Well, hold on, <laughs> I, I will say I think I think my rebuttal is just like ironclad because I took it to the place where you I took it to a POV that you understand so well and so intimately. <laughs> However, I think that you, I will give you some yeah, points yeah. in your your art your final argument was was also very valid in the sense of like it's just the three things <clears throat> in a slightly different way. Right, right. It does kind of work. I guess. We can agree to disagree. <laughs> we'll leave it there, ladies and gentlemen. We'll leave it there. We'll leave it there. It's, 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 see, it's, that, that, see, people can agree to disagree in 2021, guys. It happens. That it's is true. true. That is I'm true. Gonna, I, I'm not going to call. I'm not going to call Jeff a, you know, libtard. He's not going to call me a, you know, right wing Nazi. And you know, because we do, we don't agree on this, and that's fine. You know, it's, it happens. Yeah. We're um we're we're by part we're we're by pizza partisan. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> or we're trying to be. Um by, by pizza and I don't know. Yes. Okay. Yes. But um so so Tracy and I we go back some ways. Um for anybody who's watching this and, and they not realize. Yeah, we, we go back about ten yeah, years. But... Actually, no, the first time that I met Tracy was the champs, right? Outside of outside of uh, one well, Trenton at champ at championship. Yeah. Oh yeah. my God! Yes, yes, yes. And you guys didn't actually play the show because they were treating you like garbage. They were yeah, like, no, yeah, we left. <laughs> they were being dicks. You guys, yeah. I needed, I needed, uh, I needed a document signed, and so I was there. I got my document signed. My, I needed a release signed for another documentary thing I was doing, and. And uh, yeah, you guys stormed out and you were pissed about something. I didn't even know what it was. I found out later. I, you guys explained it to me later on tour um, that, that they had treated you like garbage after you've been driving for hours or something. Some of yeah. you with a meal and whatnot. Crazy, crazy times. 
Yeah, I don't remember exactly exactly what happened there, but I just remember that the door the door guy was the impetus of it all, and he was being very just just being a dick. And uh, yeah, yeah. it had been a long day. We'd been we'd been traveling the whole day, and yeah, we were just like, well, then you know what? We don't have to play the show. So right. We didn't. So now the next time we met, which was before the tour started, hold on. We I wanted to we're, we're veering we're veering off here, but real quick, the next time we actually met though was at the train station on the way to Bluefield. It was. It was. Yeah. Um, I had uh, <laughs> I had I had flown down. I think, or I had no. I had no. I took the train. That's what it was. I took the yeah, train the and. Train. Uh, and I took a bus. Yeah, you you had taken a bus, and I and yeah. so what had happened is I got there late, and which actually coincided with when you were arriving at um, the Washington station there in DC, oh, when I was trying, when I was trying to like find a new a new way there essentially because my my train got there late and my connecting train had already left, so I basically had they basically like gave me a voucher for the Greyhound that you were on you were going to be on and that's where oh. you and I were like, Oh, Hey, Tracy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff. Right. You know? <laughs> so, and, um, so, and we wrote, and we rode down to Bluefield together on the Greyhound because my, hey, my, you on my bus? Yeah. I don't even remember you being on the bus. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, we, right. And then you were right, right, right. Okay. Um, and what's, and that was the very beginning of a journey that essentially <laughs> was thousands and thousands of miles. We, we, it's this is out of chronological order, but it just makes more sense. I say from Moscow to California when I talk about it, but yeah. that's not the order of how we went. <laughs> no, no. But it spans the the half the globe. We traveled yeah. half the globe, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. Pretty, pretty funny. Um, and was it only fifty five shows? I was I was noticing that on uh, on the poster you're making about it. Was it only fifty five shows? I believe it was only 55 shows. I could be wrong. I That was the number that was just rattling around in my brain. And the reason why I had that number is because technically, and this is really crazy, especially for a music fanatic like myself, the band that I've seen more times than any other band in my entire life, in my entire concert going experience, even though I was technically working those shows, is Blitzkid. Wow. I've seen more Blitzkid shows than any other band any other band really it's kind of crazy it makes sense because yeah you were there the whole time so yeah i was yeah i was there for for every moment and the rehearsals and yada 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 but hold on let's let's put a pin in that for a minute and let's go let's 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 start with today thank you you yeah we're, we're gonna take it back because we'll, we'll we'll go down we'll go down that 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 uh that rabbit hole or whatever um right I, I, whenever I do see, we were talking, we were just griping about the algorithms on Facebook and how things are buried. And, you know, unless you're, you're at somebody's front door, you really don't see very much going on. And uh, what I've seen in my peripheral um, as, you know, as while doing promotion of this thing is that you got a hot sauce. Your band has a hot sauce. What's up with that? How did that come about? We we've had two we've had two actually now um, two hot sauces yeah uh, wait. there she is yes exactly yeah, yeah. Uh, that is that is the crying wolf uh, Carolina Reaper hot sauce <laughs> which which we just released we released that we it's 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 called that because we actually have a song called crying wolf um, I gather I like about. that that's great branding and um, you know Jeff uh, Jeff Concor. Did the uh, did the label for us? He he just offered up that artwork for me one day, and I was just like, "Wow, all right." Um, I'm like, "Dude, that looks awesome." I was like, "You know," I said, "I want." I, I all I told him was, "I said I want like a cartoon wolf, and like you know, a reaper pepper to be integrated into this somehow." And that's what he came up with. And actually, I have a bottle right here. <laughs> is it is, is it really spicy? Um, not really. I, I mean, to me, not. I mean, I'm a psycho, and I like stupid, spicy stuff. So, to me, not really. If you overuse it, yes, it will. It will bite you. But um, are you are you more of a spicy kind of? Can can you take more heat than Howie Wowie? Has this been gauged? Who's who's uh, who can who can man up with the the hot stuff more? Or is that not? Is I think 
I think I would I would probably tap out on a lot of the stuff that Howie Howie does because it's all extract. A lot of it's all extract based and it has no flavor. It's just masochistic. Like, Seems yeah, masochistic. It's just like Why? you know, I, I, I like for my stuff to taste good. It can burn me up, but I want it to taste yeah. good as well. You know, and that's again a gathering of nuns, crying wolf. <laughs> Here are a lot of Reaper hot sauce. Sold out right now, though, guys. So don't message me going, "Hey, dude, where can I get some?" We don't have any more. This is only this is my personal bottle. Um, I'm sure you're going to get. I'm sure there will be more in the future, right? You're going to do more varieties. You do some more, yeah, because you know, honestly, honestly, this was the one. This was the one uh, compared to the other two runs that we did. Um, this one I got a lot more compliments, and uh, you know, got a lot more. Um, you know, oh, this is great. It's 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 got. A lot of heat, but it's still flavorful. I can eat it on anything, you know. Uh, so we'll probably do this one again. Um, the one we did before, previously, we did two runs of that, and that was the uh, Gathering of Nuns Give Up the Ghost Pepper uh, ah. hot sauce, which that was that was done to uh, coincide with the EP that we released this past June called Give Up the Ghost. And uh, we released the first edition of that, I think, in September, or no, August. And then... We did another one in October, and uh, yeah, there's the there's the uh, Carolina Reaper merch that we have. <laughs> now you know who this you know what this wolf reminds me of is indicative of. It's not I wouldn't say it's the exact same thing, but I just it, it came to my mind. Do you remember that band? Great band, by the way. If I I don't know if anybody's familiar with them, I've been meaning to talk about them on this show because I love them so much. Uh, Hour of the Wolf. Remember that band? Yep. They had a. Uh, they were they're friends with the zombies guys. Yes, yes, they're all they're all at a that's that's Arizona and um, they are they are a great band and they had a a very similar cartoon like WB you know Warner Brothers cartoon wolf kind of guy kind of like that yeah very 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 wily like, kind of. yes yes I like that a lot so this is and you did a vinyl as well. Wow! Look at that. Yeah, that that's that's coming out. That's it's just the uh, vinyl edition of our EP, uh, "Give Up the Ghost," um, and we did. It's going to be on 180 gram uh, red and black marble, so it's going to look awesome. Uh, Coffin Curse, Coffin Curse Records put that out for us. They're based out of like Knoxville, Tennessee area, and it's funny because when I first you know heard of that label, I'm like, I know this guy from somewhere because the guy that runs it is named Mike Billups. And I'm like, I know this guy from somewhere. As it turned out, Mike used to play in a band called the Heartbreak Kids, who then changed their name to the Darling Articles. And he was also in a band called uh, Mutual Agreement and Fairweather Fan. And they had all played shows with us, if not on the same bill, then like in the same at this at a lot of the same venues that Blitzkid would play, huh. you know, back in the day in West Virginia. So that and I, so I actually knew Mike. From wow. back in those days, yeah, so yeah, um, he 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 actually had a, um, a label previously before that called um, Radio Eat Radio Records back in the early two thousands, and their uh, their big claim to fame was that they signed uh, Hawthorne Heights before Hawthorne, oh, wow. Heights. Hawthorne Heights was huge, got huge and got signed to Victory and started playing right. tour all the time and stuff like that. What's up? I said victory. That's what I was thinking of the victory label and the swinging the guitars around like a, oh, like yeah. a hula hoop, you know, yeah. that whole yeah. thing. Right. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I like how it's, uh, you know, it's like a, what's it called? Uh, it's, it's almost got a smoky quality, like a Chipotle, yeah. like a Chipotle <laughs> right, right. Quality, you know, to it. Don't That's put great. Chipotle on the vinyl though, guys. <laughs> I'm don't sorry. Put Chipotle, don't put Chipotle sauce on the vinyl, though. Right. It's gonna taste. It's gonna sound spicy without adding any hot sauce. Okay. You don't have to. <laughs> have to do that. <laughs> so yeah, those, those we did a pre-order for those. We sold. We sold out. We sold out of them. We only did a hundred copies, but we sold out of those, and those are gonna be right. out probably end of March, early April, because the you know as you know everything's delayed right now due to COVID. Due to shipping delays. And, and with demand. vinyl, anytime, anytime you're doing anything with vinyl, that's always like a sixty to ninety day turnaround that you're looking oh, yeah. at. So, oh yeah, because there's a lot more that goes into vinyl than you know a CD or a cassette or anything like that. So that's where we I, are. I've studied a little bit of the process because of my uh, my my nerd my misfits nerd fan. Yeah, show. yeah, and it is 
the vinyl process is an insane process. It's like crazy, crazy right? Really, really crazy. And so, yeah. what did they send you? They sent you a test press, and you had to listen to the test pressing, make sure they, that it, they they will they will be. Yeah, um, oh, they I will be. Even, yeah, we haven't even gotten to the test pressing portion of the, of the vinyl yet. But yeah, so if and anyone out listen. there, pre, if anyone out there did pre order the vinyl, um, it's we haven't gotten the test pressing yet, so we don't know if it. You know, I'm sure it'll sound fine, but we got to approve that first, and then they'll actually produce the rest of the vinyls. So. That's, that's you, know, what you know, it's agonizing too. It's thank like, you guys, thank you guys for being patient and waiting on those. And you know, it's funny. It's like, I, I would imagine it's almost agonizing that you get the test pressing and it's like, wait, now I need to find a stereo with the right fidelity because I need to make sure this sounds creamy as fuck the way I want it to yeah. in the speakers, you know? Cause it's like, you know, it's not like uh, Dr. Chud's MP3 boombox, you know, uh, car car stereo test. It's like, uh, right. you know, you got to like, uh, uh, you got to listen to something that's more calibrated and, and, and allows you to hear all the, 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 the tones and frequencies yeah. that you want to hear, I would imagine. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, if you're going to listen to vinyl, you want to listen to it on a decent turntable. You know, you right. don't want to. You want to take it to like, you know, Walmart and be like, "Oh, here's a turntable. It's, <laughs> buy this one. It's twenty dollars." Yeah. Now I remember. So so now we're jumping back in time. I remember November 2012. You and I are walking along the river in Cologne. Was it the Rhine? Is that the Long Rhine? Rhine River? Yeah. We're walking it's along the Rhine and beautiful. In yeah, it was beautiful. It was a crisp, uh, cold. It was it was more crisp than it was uh, cold. Uh, yeah. It was November. It was the night after Carnival. And um, actually, I have to ask you a question about that because I don't remember. Maybe you'll be able to jog my memory. Okay. Um, but uh, <laughs> I was like, so what are you going to do now, Tracy? And you're like, well... You were like you were like that very matter of fact Tracy kind of way that you do sometimes. You're like, well, I got my. <laughs> I'm going to start a new project. It's called A Gathering of None. Although Tracy, I don't know if the name makes so much sense as it did in that in the in the winter of 2012 because it was a gathering of none. Now you you need to lose the of none. It's a gathering. <laughs> There's already a band. There was already a band called The Gathering, so we can't do that. Oh, um, <laughs> it'll always be a gathering of none, even though. Here's why. No, and, and, here, and here's why. And here's why it has remained as such. Um, and this is not. This is not me blowing smoke. I really, I really, I really think this way. Um, a gathering of none is is never has never stuck to really one set genre as far as like what we do, which is probably you know a big reason why a lot of people still don't know who the hell we are. <laughs> Um, you know it's not easily pigeonholed i mean there's there's there are elements of punk in it there's elements of metal there's elements of you know progressive rock and stoner rock and 90s alternative and it's just all over the place man um a potpourri what's that a potpourri yeah yeah, it's a potpourri exactly um it's a uh it's a melange of yeah you know it's a melange of different styles if you will um so it, it, it remains a gathering of none because of that reason. Now we say instead of it's gathering of none be just because it was me, you know, it was literally a gathering of none just because it was one person. And now yeah. it's a gathering of none because there are no genres that can gather, that can stay, that can stay put. That, ah, you know, if, that okay. makes, if that makes sense, if that makes sense. It's, it's a gathering no. of none because it's, you know, there are no set genre. There is no set genre that sticks around for, you know, every record. Well, I mean, there is, but it's other stuff on top of them too. So we don't have we don't have a genre. That's why it's still a gathering of none. <laughs> I got it. No, I got it. I got it. Um, I listen. You know, in addition to just you could have literally just said because that's the name I picked and that's the name I'm keeping. But that's like, what it was. <laughs> that's what it is. What's going to be. Right, right, but you found you found a, uh, a a personal meaning, a personal reason for yeah. why it 
it, it the name still makes sense. And so I can appreciate that. Yeah. Um, Cause it's hard. Listen, rebranding, as you know, probably I would say that you uh, know better than anybody else, how hard it is to build something up from nothing and then start over with brand new rebranding, especially considering what you guys did as a band. Right. I mean, it's kind of crazy. I don't know if people really realize what you guys accomplished as a band, you know, um, essentially you saw, from nothing. You saw, you saw where we came from. So that's why I think to you, it's probably a little bit more significant, but. I a lot of people don't don't know like you know just how middle of nowhere we were <laughs> right now. Well, I I am again. But. Well, you know it's funny because you know I, while I wouldn't call myself an you know an expert or anything, but I right. did kind of yes see not only where you came from, but I traveled with you guys, and I mean you're one of the very very short list of of men I can say that I shared a bed with like. <laughs> in uh where were we somewhere in europe we we shared i think there were a few times we might have shared short shared a bit. yeah there was more than once <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um you know but but that's my point and speak to everybody over you know your time in the band like uh, going on the journey like i literally met a journey's worth of people and interviewed yeah. them all and talked to you and um I will say that is you are really you are a really good interview subject because you you talk I was talking about this the other day on the other show you speak in you're you're a storyteller and you can speak in in sound bites and you're very succinct and to the point and it makes it draws you in so in a way your interviews alone they're kind of like a podcast <laughs> cool you know because mm-hmm. you know you know I um, I think that honestly, you know, and we've, we've we've talked about this, just you know, kind of joking around, even back then, you know, back and forth. I honestly think it's, I honestly think it's a lot to do with the fact that I'm such a student of, you know, um, professional wrestling and the, uh, you know, the art of the promo, the art of you yeah. know, telling the stories in the ring with what you're doing in the ring and stuff like that, and that's you know, the soundbite aspect of it all. I, I really, I really think I learned a lot from, you know, watching all that stuff growing and still, you know, to this day. You know, it's funny because I was trying to refresh my memory and I was just kind of like going through some stuff that I had, you know, yeah. and I, that did stand out to me. You know what I was looking at? I was looking at, we were in Iowa and it was, a day, it was a driving day and we had nothing to do. There was nothing to do. We were bored. And so we decided to just film a sketch. We just did a sketch right in the room. Coffee party. We did the coffee party sketch, but yeah. not not just you, all you guys right. were just like, I mean, you were just like, we were just making it up as we were going along and giggling, yeah. just, you know, doing the thing. But, you know, you very much, you guys all delivered. I mean, you really delivered your, your uh, and, you know, we didn't have dialogue. You were just making it up in your head. And it it, it, it came out really, really, really well. Um, it, really, it really was all improv. You know, I mean, we, the, the, the speeches, the, 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 the speeches that we wrote for, for, uh, for the intervention part. Yeah, there was a writing those. exercise. Yeah, we, yeah we, we wrote those out, but. You know, <laughs> everything else was kind of off the cuff, man. Especially at the end where I'm all like, you know, flubbing the lyrics to Eye of the Tiger, like so yeah, bad. No, it's, it's great. It's great. And and what's funny is, no, but it was almost like, it's like we had like a writer's workshop in a hotel room in I was like, okay, now everybody write your personalized letter right. to Joey. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Um, no, it was great. And the way that you interlo you you interlaced your hands with stripes just <laughs> cracked me up. It was so beautiful. It was so yeah. it, it was so plutonically intimate. I loved I loved that. I loved how plutonically intimate it was. And it just added a little touch on yeah. um on the uh, uh on the video. And uh Joe was great, Joey was great, I mean everybody was great. Um so that was that was yeah that was a lot of fun that was probably the most fun 
that anybody has ever had in a hotel room without any drugs or alcohol or girls. Just, just this. Just a bunch of guys in a ho in a hotel in Iowa, in the middle of the night. It, it almost reminds me almost reminds me like you know Wayne's World, where it's like, "Hi, we're in Delaware." You know, like that night we were kind of all like, "Hi, we're in Iowa." You know, so um, and, you know my favorite part of that, my favorite part of that whole thing was when because I had helped, if you remember correctly, I had helped Joe write some of his stuff. And for his for his uh, you know intervention speech or whatever, right? And uh, <laughs> if you remember correctly, I, you, this film is so perfectly because at the, w right when he's like, "You hooked out my sister for a cup of coffee right. from Seven Eleven," and then yeah. you like pan the and then you edited it perfectly where you pan the camera to Joey and Joey's just like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's just like super sullen and just nodding his head. You yeah, know, but he's like, like, but when he when he Joe, when Joe says that, he kind of like laughs, like, oh yeah, like, right. oh yeah, right. Well, you were um, like this. Stripes is reading his, Stripes is reading his note, and he's doing this with his face, and you're like this. Oh yeah, because I was laughing. Yeah, because you were yeah, because you were laughing. You were trying not. You didn't want it to be seen on the camera. So you're trying to pretend like you're sad, but it's so obvious that like you're you've got a smile, and it makes it. It's like that SNL situation. You know what an SNL? Uh, yeah, I broke I broke character, man. <laughs> right, right. But it's like but people love it on SNL, and that happens. So that's what was happening. You're like, yeah, dude. I felt like I felt like you know David Spade or like David Spade in the middle of like the class one of the classic Farley bits when he's just like. Yeah. You know, um, or when you know Jimmy Fallon would like start laughing and like to kind of turn away from the camera. You know, yeah, that was that was totally uh, that was totally me breaking care, and I could not help it because what broke me was when he's all like the little spoon, you know, yeah. all that. <laughs> so right, the little spoon, and and Joe, Joe Vasta, Joe is like, Joe's like, he's like, what are you fuck? Are you fucking? This is fucking stupid. He's just like. <laughs> We like, really, we're really doing this. Really, do, really, really doing this. I'm trying to do a Joe. I can't do a Joe impression. I wish he's kind of almost sounds Joe. If you listen to this, I hope you don't take offense. Oh. Joe almost kind of sounds like one of uh, Marge's sisters from The Simpsons a little bit. Because <laughs> Joe is a Joe's a smoker, and he's just got that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I can't. I can't. My voice, my voice goes too deep. Hard, hard right. to Joe, you yeah. can't. You can't, you can't imitate Joe. Can't. <laughs> it's possible. It's really, really hard. But um, yeah. I can hear his voice in my head saying, oh, "This is fucking. <laughs> what are you? Uh, this is fucking stupid. Why are we doing? You know, something like that. Why are we doing this?" <laughs> really and uh, really yeah, yeah, really, really. Um, and uh, yeah, sorry, Joe, was, I can't imitate you, dude. It was yeah. We can't do it, Joe. So we're sorry. But we tried. Joe, hey, Joe, we're just breaking balls. Do you remember this, Tracy? When just breaking balls, bro. Just breaking no, balls. No, no, when Stripes was like, dude, I'm sorry. I'm just being a dick. And it was my first tour. And, of course, <laughs> being my first tour, I want to be. I you going to say. I, I want to be like, you know, I want everybody to think that, like, I can take you know, being <laughs> racked on. Because that's the thing. Okay, a couple things to realize. One the the what I learned from my one tour experience, which I thought was pretty immersive, considering what we did. Yeah, uh, it was all it was an all inclusive, all expenses paid trip. You know, kind of vibe. It but, was it was it was an immersive an immersive uh, 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 being catapulted right into you know the what you guys do, and you know right, yeah right into, the, right into the deep end. Right into the deep end. And so in an effort to want to, you know, I, in the same way of like being like uh, a guy with, uh, what do they call those guys? And what do they call those guys when they go to meet like indigenous tribes and they're anthropologists or something? Like, you know what I mean? Like, no, 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 no. Let, let, hear me out. It's, it's like one of those guys but, yeah. who's like, Trying to say like I'm I'm one with the I'm one with what you guys are doing like you know sure. from outsider coming in and so I said to I said to uh, Stripes I go Stripes no 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 it's cool dude I can take the dick and the moment I said I can take the dick Stripe 
Stripes' his ears perked up. All you got, and then from that moment on, I never heard the end of it. Yeah, I from, never. The, from the from the rest of the rest of the tour. Matter of fact, yeah. and matter of fact, anytime. And I remember, and I remember this like so vividly now because once you you brought, I think you brought it up with Loki um, when you're in, when you're doing your uh, podcast with him. But <laughs> I just I just like shot back to that time frame in my mind because like any time we would be like unloading gear or like, you know, Jeff, you need me to carry something or Jeff, can you, you know, can you grab this? If not, it's cool. And you're like, no, I got it. No, I got it. And for, I don't know if you remember this or not, but like every time something was said like that, whether it was you or us saying it, you know, one of us would be like, yeah, man, he could take the dick. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it, it never, what's up, Loki speak of the devil. There, oh. there he is right there. He's gonna he's gonna make fun of me now. No, he won't. He won't. <laughs> um freaking yeah. So so that was like that was like a full immersion into this sort Absolutely. of situation. But let's let's take it back even further. Um what do you think, in your opinion? Uh, obviously you have to have good songs, and Blitzkid had good songs, Blitzkid had good music, there's no denying that. But what other component do you think really puts you guys above the rest, above some of your contemporaries and, and allowed you to sort of really um, dig your claws into, you know, I don't know, whatever people know about Blitzkid. That's a good question. Um, and it's one that I've, that, that I've pondered as well, because now, you know, we find ourselves being, you know, almost what 20, we're 24 years old now as a band. We're crazy. We're almost, we're almost able to get, you know, our insurance lowered <laughs> as a band. No, um, I think, I think the biggest thing that people kind of tended to gravitate towards us with was and to our detriment. Sometimes uh, there was just no pretension, man. It was like, um accessibility yeah accessibility and you know nimvin nimvin said it perfectly once he was doing uh he was doing an instagram live with ghouls uh, a little while ago a few months back now and they were talking about you know first meetings and first playing with us in germany and stuff like that and you know i, I wouldn't do it now obviously but you know our our whole thing was we had no plan. We had no plan of attack. We had no like modus operandi as it were. We just kind of, we just kind of went for it, man. Just kind of like, you know, just threw a, just like took the baseball bat and hit the brick wall and saw what happened kind of thing. And that's exactly how, <laughs> that's exactly how Nem described it. He was like, you know, you guys are just like, like somebody throwing a baseball bat, like toward a brick wall or like, you know, swinging a baseball <laughs> at a brick wall. And it, you know, it was just, you know, just just a just a train wreck, but it was awesome at the same time. When I, because I remember vividly that day, it was at the um, Endless Summer Festival in uh, Leipzig, and we were playing like a second stage area with them. And right before we go on, we we, had, we they went on, we went on, we headlined it this night. And um, Nem Nem was, he's like, I'm up I'm up on stage, you know, we're backline second backline, whatever. He's like, hey man, and you know. We were notorious probably up until like, you know, you toured with us of not using tuners on stage. <laughs> Finally, the last couple of years of the band, we're like, we should probably start using tuners. But, um, you know, it was just one of those things where it was just like, you know, see, see the pants, whatever happens, happens. If it's a little out of tune, fuck it. It's punk rock. You know, I'll tune up after this song, whatever, you know, kind of thing. In hindsight, probably not the best way to go about it, but... But I remember him going, hey, man, if you want to use my tuner, go ahead, man. He was like, here you go. He, like, literally handed it to me, you know. And I'm like, I'm good, man. Thanks. <laughs> he just kind of was like, all right. <laughs> it's kind of, okay. You know, and we proceeded to, you know, destroy uh, ourselves and our instruments for, you know, an hour. And uh, everybody, everybody loved it, thankfully. And I think, I think that kind of that kind of I'm not trying to get romanticize it or anything like that when I say this, but I think it's going to sound sounded no matter how, but 
I'll just go for it. <clears throat> I think I think that kind of uh, that kind of reckless abandon that we had a lot of times, and uh, just just going for it despite despite ourselves <laughs> on stage, especially I think was what endeared a lot of people to us, and you know the fact that we came from literally nowhere, Ville USA, and just just decided one day, you know, screw it. Let's just go start playing out. And that's literally what we did. We would start playing down, you know, hour and a half, couple hours from our home right. here in Bluefield in Bristol, Tennessee. Bristol, Johnson City. yeah. Bristol. And yeah, you were, you were with us in Bristol. Um, Do so, you yeah. remember? Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. I got to interject. Do you, I will never forget, by the way, the first couple of, of the first week or two when it was, I think the first week it was just me, you and ghouls. Yeah. Before before Stripes or Joe arrived, yeah. and I'll tell you, I have never laughed so hard. We did. We had a lot of. There was a lot of laughter, and I'll never forget when we were in. You guys were recording. God, what were you recording? Um, the Devil is a Vampire, and you were recording. Um, what was the other one? Uh, the uh, that older one we never released called. Uh, <sighs> Excuse me. Um, an older song we never released called "Ad Nauseum Memore." Right, I remember that. No, and then there was a third track. What was the third track? Uh, or maybe you were just doing uh, folk- vocals for know. it. Also, oh yeah, um, also another another track. Monocane Blues. Monocane Blues. Yeah, that that oh, actually came out on the uh, split on the Crypt Keeper Five split. Yeah. Yeah, and so did so did Devils of Vampires. So you did. So there were three songs. And Chris came in, Chris Wright came in and, and did drums and please tell Chris, I say hello the next time you see him. Um, and I'm very sorry for Chris. I never, <laughs> I didn't say anything to him at the time, but I got, I swear to God, swear to God, haven't spoken to Chris in years, but the first person that popped into my head when Neil Pert died, swear to God was Chris White. And I said, oh, oh yeah. poor Chris. I said, oh, poor yeah. Chris. <laughs> I was like, I was like, damn. <laughs> Yeah, I was it, like, that's he, terrible, man. He took um, it hard. He took it hard. He uh, he's actually he actually is really, really kicking himself in the ass for not seeing them on their last tour that they did. Hey, he I mean, come on. Well, he, the, he, he's seen he, them previously. He's seen them like seven, eight yeah. times. Yeah, so there you go. The, didn't see him on the last tour though. Well, which listen, been, you know, which you never you know when it's know, the last you know? tour. You never know when it's the last tour. Yeah. Uh, uh, our tour manager Chris didn't know it was his last tour. I remember Chris uh, in in Europe, but hold on, wait, we're ping ponging all over the place. I'm going to redirect us to being at the recording studio and you're digitizing early, early blitz kid practices. Um, It was like, and and it's the pumpkin patch murders, but it's like super slow. It's like, like it takes like five, it takes like 10 minutes for you to do the intro or whatever. Yeah, it's like, it's like, a, it's like a doom metal song. Right. And then <laughs> uh, this guy, Moose, calls up on the phone. Moose. Yeah, yeah. And you and Moose just went back and forth, and I was in stitches. And I don't even know what was so funny about it, but it had me think, cracking up. It had me cracking up, dude. You I guys, think a lot, I, think a lot, I think a lot of it is, uh, you know, Moose's accent, for one. He's, he's got that. He's got that East, you know, he's got that East Tennessee drawl, you know. Hi, man. Yeah, that's it. What the you know? You know. <laughs> he's so great, dude. man. And I was like, dude, I, I like, I lost my shit that day when we were talking on the phone because we were, remember, we were going to like, we were going to stay there. We were going to stay at Moose's house that night. He's, he's like, oh, hey, you need a place to stay or whatever. Y'all come stay here with me. You know, I got, I got a couch and, you know, you know, from floor space, man, that's about it. But y'all welcome to it. And we're like, awesome, dude. Thank you. And he's like, and I was like, so what have you been doing? If you remember this, I was like, so what have you been doing? And I'm just sitting here in the air conditioning with my titties flopping around. And God, I, and you I have a memory this. like a steel trap because you know what? I don't remember the oh words, but I know, I know that you're correct. I know that is correct, even though I don't remember it. That uh, yes. No, there and was a thing he, about titties. He, he, just, he just pops off with stuff like that all the time. Like just like like effortlessly, he should be a nonchalant. It's nonchalant, yeah. though. dude. Okay, so funny story, and I and I told and I told I think I told Jason this. I know I know I know I told Jason this, but I never told. I don't know if I've told Joe this. So Joe, if you listen, <laughs> we were playing 
Bristol, Tennessee at one point, and Mr. Monster had played with us there a couple times previously. This goes back to like, it's probably late 2002, I think. Right before we were to go on tour with him, I think we played there a couple of months prior or whatnot. And I had the Mr. Monster shirt on, um, you know, has them all in the car, you know, the, the murder for hire shirt, you know, classic Mr. Monster shirt that came out right before they released over your dead body or I don't know, my timeline might be incorrect on, I'm sure Joe's going to correct me if it is. But, um, uh, so standing outside, Moose comes out because Moose was, Moose is like, you, you have to understand guys, Moose Roberts is a Bristol, Tennessee music scene institution in and of himself. He's been around that scene down there. I've been playing in bands since like the late eighties. And the dude is like, well, he's my age. He's like, you know, mid forties or whatever. <clears throat> he's still putting out stuff. Now he, he goes by moose, moose train wreck Roberts and the monkey paws or something like that. And uh, it's just this, it's just this awesome grimy, like blues country rock punk stuff. And it's just, it's just killer. But um, he, he, he's a fantastic guitar player, but a uh, great songwriter, very prolific. He puts out like two or three releases a year. All on, his, all on his all on all on band camp, you know. He just um, records in his house or something, like his yeah, studio. Yeah. Yeah. I think he record. I think he sometimes records where we were recording those tracks that you were with us. Um, right. But most of the time, I think yeah, he does a lot of stuff just on his own DIY in his house. Um, but so yeah, <laughs> to know Moose, to know Moose, guys, you know he's like again we said very nonchalant, but you know, and and the thing about Moose is I I'm, I know we all probably have friends who if you have a friend that like is a complete ball buster, like a hundred percent of the time, even though like they might piss you off with their ball busting a little bit, you know, they like you because they're busting your balls. Right. That's kind of how Moose was. So anyway, cut to me wearing this Mr. Monster shirt outside of the venue there at seventh street. <clears throat> I'm just kind of leaning up against the wall. We had just, we had just played or whatever. And he comes up to me like this. And he's, he wears glasses as well. He's just like, <laughs> and I was like, "What's up, man?" And he's like, "Does it again?" <laughs> and he, goes, and he goes, "Mr. Monster." I said, I said "Yeah, man. Yeah, they're they're they're, they're, they're kick-ass band. Good friends of ours." He's like, "Mr. Monster." I said, "Yeah." He's like. Man, why are you so fucking gay? And like, <laughs> I like, and I loved every second of it because I'm like, that's Moose likes me, man. That's awesome. You know? oh. Yeah, dude, like, why are you so fucking gay? And I don't mean to offend anyone by saying that, but that's what he said. Um, it, you know. Context, context of the time, people. Let's just remember we we live in an enlightened age. We know that that's not the right. That's not the right way, code of conduct today, but at the time, it was very casual. It was a casual vernacular that has since been a lot has changed. That's yeah. that's the you know, and, I, 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 and you know, don't get me wrong. I used to be, I used to be a big offender of, you know, using the f word, uh, and I don't mean I don't mean the f dash 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 word. I mean the other one, right? Uh, right. You know, so, but I but I I try. You're, like, you've enlightened. You've enlightened yourself. Yeah, I try my damn just not to not to say stuff like that. Now. And it's it's hard because growing up here, you know, I was like, that's, what, what, that's, what, you, that's what that, that's what you called your buddy, you know, when you're busting your <laughs> right. balls growing up. And I'm not making excuses. Like I, I literally do try not to do that now. But um, but yeah, back back, you know, that again, that was 2002. That was 19 years ago. That's right, 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 so, right. You know, um. You know, I'm not, I'm not defending said language or anything like that, but this is just how you talk to one another back then. You know, um, looking I don't through think the it's, defending, it's not defending. What it is, yeah. you're, you're just providing it's additional context of of the time. I, I get it. I get it. Um, it's, like, it's like the disclaimers now when you see them on, you know, before like 16 candles or something, you know. Right. That's right. oh, 16 this, candles. This, holy crap. <laughs> It's crazy to think that that movie got made. That was like normal in the eighties, and now today, like, it's just crazy how that stuff. Couldn't do any of it. Couldn't do any of it, dude. Um, that or like a lot of those, which I love, 
You know, I grew up on them. A lot of those yeah. John Hughes, John Hughes movies, man. You couldn't couldn't do that shit now. You know, like that that one scene in a uh, Breakfast Club where he's where he's under the table with Molly Ringwald. That's like that's like yeah. sexual assault, dude. Like, yeah, you can't get away with that today. It doesn't yeah, that doesn't, yeah. doesn't fly. Uh, yeah, but again, dude. context of context of the time. But but um. Uh, oh wait wait wait, dude! Uh, I don't mean to cut you off. I don't mean to cut you off. I have a no. I have another move story for you, real quick. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> Our uh, we, we, you know him, uh, Joey, who had went on tour with us when you were out with us as well. Joey Low, Joey, Joey fucking Low, Joey fucking Low. Um, watch him drink coffee. What? What is it? Joey Low. Watch Joey him drink f- coffee. Watch him fucking go. Joey yeah. Low. Joey fucking Low. Yeah. Um. That that was Joey's theme song. Um, <laughs> by the way, guys, Joey Lowe drank. This is why oh, we yeah. did the coffee, this is why we did the coffee party video. Yeah, Joey Lowe drank two thousand three hundred and twenty three ounces of coffee in three and a half weeks on tour. Did you actually? Is that the actual number? You actually remember the number? I mean, I don't know what the number is. I just that was, that was the number that we tallied because if you remember correctly, every time we'd stop. To get like a drink or gas up or whatever, Joey yeah. get a coffee. And, oh yeah, dude. that was a big goal. And, and we're like, and remember every time we're like, how many ounces is that, dude? And you would like, you would like log it on your laptop. Did and I? At the end of it, <laughs> I don't remember. And at the end of it, you know, that night in New Jersey after that Ghouls Night Out show, we're like, all right, dude, what's the tally? And I just, and I, and I remember it because we, when we, when we said the. Um, we said like you know two thousand three hundred twenty three you know whatever. We looked it up in gallons, and it ended up being like yes, that are 17, sixteen or seventeen gallons of coffee yeah. in like a matter of three and a half weeks, and that's he drank that's a lot of coffee. That's insane. <laughs> but anyway, um, the other Muth story that I have involves Joey. We yes. were again, we were again down in Bristol, Bristol, Tennessee, getting ready to play a big like five band bill. Um, it was us, the Blue Light Casualties, the Hypodermics, uh, the Haints, which Moose was in. Um, yeah, he was in a band called the Haints. Um, yeah, yeah. What, I was just trying to, I, as you were literally saying that, and then you repeated it, I'm going, the Haints. The Haints, yeah. The Haints, like H A I N T S, the Haints. Yep. Yep. Is that like Ain't with an H at the beginning? Yeah. What does that it's a, mean? It's a, it's a take on it's a take on you know how southern people say ain't. They ain't doing that. Ain't. 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 They ain't doing that. Got it. You, know, Got it. you put the, you put the H sound in there and it becomes ain't. Um, I like it. It's spooky. <laughs> so I yeah, like so, it. so it was this big five band bill and <laughs> Joey Joey had green hair at the time and was like you know. Fresh as a new punk rock daisy, was all immersed in the culture. You know, was like right. loving it. Had the spike bracelets. You know, the whole nine was really was really getting immersed, immersing himself into it, identifying with it, and you know, really as one does. Yeah, you know, and was really like in love in love with it, right? So, so the one thing I'm, I'm gonna throw him under the bus a little bit now. I'm sorry, Joey. Um, the yeah. one thing he had not, the one thing he had not done to complete his punk rock ensemble that day was uh, he would, he would paint his nails black. You know, we've all done it. I've done it. Um, probably done we'll it. do it again. Probably we'll do it again at some point, you know? Um, so he's painting his nails. Right. And I don't know if it was, I don't know if it was Goolsby's car or someone else's, but he was doing it like with the door open, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, <laughs> Moose, he, Moose is like, you know, parks his car, gets out. And he's, you know, Joey, Joey had met Moose a couple times previously from being down there with us. And he's like, hey, Moose. He's like, he's like what time doors open? He's like, I think I think at eight o'clock, you know. And so, you know, the whole time Joey's just like, you know, oh, OK, cool. Okay. How many bands are tonight? Moose turns around. I don't know, Miss fucking Claire. Oh, why don't you ask somebody else? <laughs> and like walks away. Called him Miss Miss Fucking Claire All, and I was like, "Oh my god, what a and smart like, motherfucker!" And yeah, and dude, like, and you know, <laughs> meant no harm, meant no ill will by it, just yeah. just being moose, you know. And I was just like, "I'm dying," and Joey's just like, "Like he's like," I was like, 
That's just moose, bro. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, I got to tell you, we laughed. We really, we we laughed hard on that couch while they were while while uh, I think it was Mike Stevenson was Mike digitizing. Stevenson, yeah. He was digitizing those tapes, and then and then at some point Troy yeah. came through the door. And Troy, for those of you who don't know, was um, the hold on. Let me see if I got my hold on. You, you let me see. Let me see. Ready? Hold on. <laughs> One, two, three. Fourth Blitz Kid drummer. Um, let me see. Yeah, no, I've got a count. Okay, Chris? so there was there was Chris. And there was Doctor Stu. There was Billy uh, Bones. Billy Bones. Yeah. yeah, fourth drummer. Fourth drummer. <laughs> four four of eleven. Yeah, four of eleven. Uh, <laughs> walks in uh, Troy, who you know kind of looks at the time. He looks kind of like a he looks kind of like a like some like a Calvin Klein model. The way he is, just like he's got a, a a neat haircut. He's wearing like a V neck. You know, just kind of like that looks doesn't look at all like you know the way you know we would later sure. find out. You know, he sits in front of the camera like, hey, you got to interview Troy, and Troy is like you know talking about his big floppy balls. <laughs> Played a stand up bass. He played stand up yeah. bass. Big floppy balls are flopping around, or some some nonsense like that. And yeah, uh, he just he was funny. And you know who hated him uh, with a passion was uh, your pal Jason. Did not yeah. like Troy. They did not. Did not. I can. I'll never forget. I don't, I don't think. It, I don't think it was a dis. I, I think they just. I there think they loved one another. I think it was just a personality clash. You know. Troy was Troy's always been a big, you know, big fun loving kid, and right. you know, never serious. And Jason was like, "All right, it's time to get serious," you know. And well, Troy never was like that. So I'll never forget when I was one of the times I interviewed Jason, uh -huh. and I was like, "So tell me about Troy. Tell me about uh, uh, Troy." And he's like, "I'd rather not talk about that drummer." And he's just like straight up, like, like wow. whole thing just sunk. And then he goes, I'd rather not talk about that drummer. Let's move on to the next question. I was like, oh, <laughs> I was like, damn. I was like, so I, and I forgot, I, maybe it was Joe or somebody else mentioned that. Yeah, they didn't, it was, uh, it was like a uh, oil water type situation, I think is the best way. Yeah, to I, I, yeah, they just, they just yeah. didn't work. You know, yeah. they, didn't, they didn't, they didn't work well together. And, you know, it's just they some, not some humor or something, you know? Yeah, I think, I think they just kind of rubbed one another the wrong way. You know, unintentionally, but you know, right. it is what it is. Right. Uh, but yeah, he came into the studio and he was a riot. But to answer, so I asked you a question before about like what what about made, makes you guys stand out? And you know what I think it is, honestly? I think it's definitely what you said, accessibility for sure. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was definitely one of my outside observations. But Having you know talked to you guys through interview and and talking to people and what you know, I think the accessibility is actually a secondary factor to the first right. factor, which is consistent, incessant, constant touring. Yeah, just yeah. endless, endless touring as a band. That's what you guys did. You guys toured everywhere. You you really you picked up. You know, you picked up your wheels and you you drove everywhere. Wherever you drove, then you were accessible, and yeah. you kept hitting the same places over and over again. And it reminded me of the philosophy. I think the Bouncing Souls talked about that about you know spider webbing. You know, you start small and you keep hitting the same places, and then you expand your web and you keep hitting the same places and yada yada yada. And so, one thing that should be said about Blitzkid is that you know through that you know that constant, the only two constants were you and Steve, right. you know, so you guys really saw, you guys really saw it more than anybody else that you, uh, you really did sort of, uh, you, you created a, a, whatever, a brand, a clout or whatever you want to call it um, in this, in this niche genre of music. You know, I think so. You know, I mean, I don't, um, I don't say that, you know, to try to toot our own horn or anything like that. But yeah, we, we, we consistently, uh, you know, put our, put our money where our mouths are. Yes. Dropped you there. Um, we put our money where our mouths are, you know, and uh, it was just, it was just one of those things where, you know, 
I'll be perfectly honest with you. There were times when I'm like, God, you know, I'm so sick of playing shows, but you know, it, it, it helped, you know, in the long run, it was, it was, you know, kind of like, well, this is for the, you know, greater good, so to speak. And, you know, it's going to get us, you know, more, we didn't look at it as, you know, it's going to make us more money because we never made money. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You know, we, we just looked at it as it's going to get us more notoriety, more people are going to know about us, more people are going to know who we are, that sort of thing. Did you, um, did you notice a jump, a significant jump? And it's probably, as I probably have this on tape somewhere, but I'm asking you again because I don't remember. Um, right. Did you notice a significant jump from 2006, 2007 after those two tour cycles where you spent the better part of a year on the road? Did you notice a significant jump in that recognition? Oh yeah, absolutely. Because that's especially especially over in uh, well, both both places over you know in the states and over and over in Europe, we started noticing that you know our uh, our our stock had risen a little bit, and uh, you know we started getting more offers to play like bigger shows, bigger festivals over in Europe, and <laughs> you know started getting offers to play like bigger shows with bigger bands, you know, on, not on tour, but just like a show here and there, we'd get an offer to play, you know, and mind you at the time, you know, in the U S especially, we didn't have a booking agent. So this was all just coming from, you know, when did you get a booking agent? Word, that word, word, of, word of mouth, you know, right. When did we, what, when, when did you, uh, eventually you did get a booking agent, but that was a lot later, right? Yeah. We got, we got hooked up with, um, Dan and Shan. Right. Dan was his name. Dan was the 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 mother effort with the, the crazy routing all over the the long drive. It was it was you know what, but at the end of the day, man, like at the end of the day, for as much as much as we you know lamented about it, it was just kind of you know he booked us where we were, where he could book us, you know, and yeah. tried to route it as much as it would make sense. Um, but yeah, it doesn't mean that it was it was fun to go through at the time having to drive from, you know, Las Vegas to Salt Lake City and then <laughs> Salt Lake City to Chicago and stuff like that. It but I mean, luckily we had things forth. off in yeah. between. But. It did get us back and forth across the U.S. in a very short period of time. I three, you know. three and a half weeks, man. You know, yeah, <laughs> it was it was it was something else. Now, do you remember? How well do you remember this? Because I definitely, I have a good memory of this besides, you know, uh, you know, seeing video of it uh, in addition to being there. We were both there at the time. Do you remember what happened on the way to Nashville? The, uh, the, 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 the biker compound? No. No, that no, was, that was Georgia. That was Georgia, right? That was Augusta, Georgia. Yeah, yeah. that was crazy. No, um, on the way to Nashville. On the way to Nashville, do you remember what happened there? Oh, the, oh, we blew a tire, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Remember that's that? Right. That was insane. And we got to the show like we we were go, we got to the show with enough time basically to load up, load our gear on, and like go on stage. And that right. was yeah, yeah, yeah. That <laughs> that was rough, man. That was a rough day. That was rough, uh, and it was like it was like middle of summer, so it's like hot as balls. <laughs> yeah, you but know. it was it was dangerous too because the guy, the guy, we were supposed to drive out to Texas in in hundred ten degree whatever heat or however hot it would have been, and he what ha what we later discovered about the box truck was that the inner tire was completely void of air. It had no air. It, we were literally sitting on a time bomb and had one of those tires pop, we would have rolled over. Oh, and yeah. Driving through desert, that's when stuff like that possibly could go down. But what happened was uh, Goolsby was trying to like, Goolsby was trying to fill up that tire with air. He can't reach it. There's the, he's putting the quarters in the thing and rocking it back and forth, trying to get... I, that to me, the reason why that moment stands out in my mind is because that to me really was a personification of just hard grinding as a band. You got to make it to a show. It's it's a matter of economics because that show pays for the gas that goes to the next show that goes to the right, next right. Show, sort of thing, and um, as well as you know putting on the show because that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to put on the show, and here you are, here we are. 
Like, just Excuse in, me, keep you on. I apologize. It's okay. It was just in an impossible situation where you know the, the the quarters are getting stuck in the in the air machine isn't even turning on. You got to rock the air machine just Murphy, to get Murphy's law in full effect, bro. That's yeah. what happened that day. It was really, it was really, really, really insane. And um, and you did play the show. And then do you remember what happened to Joey after that show? No, I don't. I I don't I, again I, you know, dude. I mean, how many how many friggin' tours and shows you've done? It all kind of blends together. And for me, it, it it stands out easier. Um freaking um Joey, Joey hurt his back. He right. okay, yeah. Yeah. backwards yeah. and he was like he was in that kind of pain where he was in that kind of pain where he was like just profusely sweating he wasn't screaming i don't mean to, I don't mean to laugh because i know it sucked but yeah right man, right, I, right looking back looking back on it i'm just like i felt so bad for him right 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 it's not it's not that we're not we're not making light of Joey's <laughs> poor situation right, but right. what's funny was that joey completely internalized the, the 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 discomfort and the the um injury that he felt and the only way it expressed itself at least this is how i saw it at the time was the 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 constant beads of sweat that would ooze down his forehead as he just sat in agony yeah yeah it, it was nuts. It was nuts. It was we intent, in- man. You know, I, th- I think that's, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people assume that, you know, bands go on tour and it's, you know, woo-hoo, rock and roll and strippers and, you know, coke, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. It ain't, it ain't, man. <laughs> I mean, you know, it can be, I guess, but, you know, we were never that type of band, but it, it's, it's hard work, dude. <laughs> like, you right. know, a lot of people, a lot of people don't seem to understand that, you know, you're basically, you know, from the time you get to the venue, you're to equate it to something like, you know, physical activity or exercise or something like that. From the time you get to the venue, you're working out, you know, as in load in, you know, yeah. and, and you're, you know, then you're, then you're doing your cool down workout when you're, when you're, <laughs> when you're, you know, setting up merch and like putting empty, empty totes, empty road cases back in the van, whatever. And then, and then you, and then you have your then you have your rest and then you have your 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 post workout rest and then right then you then you work out again for an hour hour and a half for the show you know <laughs> and then you work out for 30 45 minutes however long it takes to load up everything and, and then you have your post workout rest again <laughs> see you know so you're so you're basically you know like i said again to equate it to something like you know physical activity exercise whatever you're working out you know, twice a day for like, you may as well say, you know, three, three and a half, four hours at a time. And then the rest of the time you're, you know, resting, but you're not resting because your mind is going a million miles an hour thinking about you having to do it the next day or, you know, thinking about what went wrong, what went wrong the day before when you did it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just a constant, constant flux of learning and, you know, what works, what doesn't work. And, you know, um, especially, especially like, you know, for bands like us that were on the road all the time, we had, we knew like, you know, through just sheer experience of like traveling through the areas multiple times or whatever, like, Oh yeah, this gas station's always cheap or, you know, or, but they still have good quality gas or, Right. Yeah, this, this place has decent food, even though it's like a mom and pop joint, but it's cheap. And you know, when we ate there the last thirty times we went through the city, <laughs> you know, it was always good. So let's stop there, you know, or things like that. You just kind of develop a. Um, it's. I think it's an. Inter- that's an interesting point too. Is when you're on the road so much like that, you kind of develop a, uh, you know, a roadmap in your mind of like all of the spots that you need to right. go to like as far as as far as um you know what what places to go and what cities and who has the best who has the best burger who has the best gas station or you know etc cetera, etc cetera. so you kind yeah. of learn you kind of you kind of it's you know it's very much it's very much you know seeing america through the windshield but yes you, know, you learn you yes. learn like you know you learn like Oh, when, you know, like I've told people just out of the blue sometimes, like, oh, when you're in, you know, this part of Florida, go to, uh, go to Tijuana Flats. 
You know, right. just, you know I mean, that's kind of that is pretty crazy when you think about it. I, I, you know, that is the one most desirable romantic sort of side of that life that yeah. I could understand. Uh, just being a, a Rolling Stone and seeing so much across so many places. I said to JV, it was either JV or Loki. It's kind of like being a pirate. You know yeah, what I mean? Absolutely. Pirate, absolutely you know? like a pirate. Like a pirate you know, life. You go, into a, you go into a town, you wreak havoc, you leave. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> now, do you remember what happened in Phoenix, Arizona on stage? I asked Joe about this. He doesn't remember. I asked Davey Calabrese about this. He was, Did you he was at the show. He did not remember until I, I kind of jogged his memory. Do you remember what happened during uh, a song that you were singing? Am oh, I my God. Yeah, yeah. During, during She Dominates when the two ladies got up on stage and they were being, yeah. like, whipped by this dude. Yeah, and we, we did not prompt. We did not tell right, them to do right, it. Right, it was not. No, you did not prompt it. It just happened. <laughs> did those, now? Here's what I want to ask you, though. First of all, now, now, you had they they had their they were behind you. Yeah, they, they had their. Uh, you were out singing out front, and they were doing it sort of behind you. And I was standing off to the side of the stage, so I was getting it on on tape. And I kind of like walked. I, I walked across Goolsby. Uh, and came behind you, and I'm, and you know, it's not like heavy. It's not like he was breaking skin or anything. He was just, you know, it was playful. Yeah. It was playful, but it was like this weird thing, like where this guy was like, "All right, now when he plays, she dominates. We're gonna go up there. You're gonna put your hands on the wall. I'm gonna take out my whip." And he like kind of licks the whip a little bit. He just starts going, <laughs> it's kind of like this, and they're just lot. They're they're all just like uh, they're all into it. Um, and what do you think? Did, did they did they come up to you after the show? Do you remember talking to them like after or before or anything? And then, I don't I don't remember. I just remember that happening. Yeah, <laughs> and um, just kind of like <laughs> trying trying to pay attention to what I was doing, you know, on st on stage playing the right. song, whatever. But like you know, off to the side of me, I'm just kind of like, you know, like what's going on over here? Yeah, you know, kind of thing, and. Uh, no, no. That I, to my recollection, <laughs> to the best of my recollection, yeah, nobody came up to us and we're like, "Hey, you know, during she dominates, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna get up on stage and you know, I'm gonna whip these girls, and, you know, because it's sexy or I don't know, you know." <laughs> I think it was just their tribute to the song. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think it was just you know, know like you know, an, an homage, if you will. <laughs> I mean, that's one of isn't that's like one of the most played songs on on the Spotify, right? On a lot of perverts out there, I guess. I guess, but I mean, people really like that. I mean, Spotify doesn't lie; people like that song, and you know, it's got over, it's got over a million streams, dude. Like, so it, clearly, it clearly it speaks to people in a way where they're like, "Oh man, Blitz Kid's coming on Friday. <laughs> we're gonna get up there, you know, like like Elizabeth, Sarah. We're gonna get up there. I'm gonna take my whip out, and I'm just gonna 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 go. We're gonna go at it, and it's gonna yeah, be great. Yeah. You know, I, uh, <laughs> I I don't know, man. I it's just one of those things. Uh, like to be perfectly honest with you, like I wrote that song. Because, and I'm totally throwing myself under the bus here. I wrote that song because I wanted to write a song similar to, in lyrical content anyway, not musically, in lyrical content to the song Ultimate Devotion by Strung Out. Huh. And then that song is actually like, he mentions a writing crop and, you know, you know, it's a very, it's a very like, you know, I'll, I'll be your... I'll be your masochist if you'll just have me kind of thing. <laughs> so that's, yeah. that's kind of the vibe, you know, and like, again, <laughs> throwing myself under the bus, mom, Steph, if you're listening, cover your ears. Um, <laughs> I've, 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 I was, I was involved at one point with a, a lady friend who was into some of those things and that I mentioned in the song and, you know, we never got around to trying any of them, but I was, I was all for it, you know, and then we broke up. And so, you know, and I just remember, <laughs> so I just remember when I wrote that song, I played it for, for Jason first over the phone. 
because I was like, man, I was like, I feel like I'm ripping you off here. I was like, I feel like this could be like a Mr. Monster type song. And, uh, you know, it's very, the chorus is, the chorus is very similar to over your dead body, you know? So I was like, I feel like I'm ripping you off. Let me know, you know? So I played it for him. And <laughs> the first thing he says to me, which I still remember to this day, and I, yeah, I love him to death for it. The first thing he says to me is like, you know, it sucks that you could sing that well at like one in the afternoon. First of all, wow. <laughs> he goes, that's two. A nice compliment. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was, I was like, oh, that's, that's cool. Um, and two, he was like, you know, he was like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of close, but he was like, I didn't write those chords. I, I stole it from somebody else, you know, like it ain't going to be the first time somebody's done that chord progression. So, you know, he was like, whatever. So he kind of like, gave me his blessing, so to speak. So then I let Steve, then I let, excuse me, I let Goolsby hear it. Steve, everybody knows his name. It's fine. Um, (laughs) I let Goolsby hear it. (laughs) Rumpelstiltskin. (laughs) I let him hear it and he just goes, he's reading the lyrics because he came over to my house, you know, he's reading the lyrics while playing it and he's just like, you need to get laid, dude. (laughs) So I'm just like, Okay, that notwithstanding is now, who wrote song. she did he write She Wolf in response or who wrote she did She Wolf come before he, or after he, he that she, wolf. she Wolf came before. Um interesting. Yeah, She Wolf came before she dominates. Uh that was actually about um an ex Those were both on Trace 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 of the Stranger, right? They were, yeah, but She Wolf was written before uh She Dominates. Um I think, yeah. Yeah, they're both on Trace of the Stranger. Have me. I have to think about this stuff now. Um, uh, but yeah, he wrote that before I wrote She Dominates because that was about an ex of his, you know, that had kind of, you know, done him done him wrong kind of thing. Right, and, a breakup song or whatever. Yeah, you know, and, uh, and but yeah, and so, and I don't even remember at the time, I was like, dude, I want to call this, I want to call this song. I didn't have a title for it at the time. I just was using the phrase, you know, She Dominates in the chorus. And right. I said, I, uh, I said, I want to call this song She Dominates because it's, you know, I say that, you know, in the chorus so much, like, it just seems like that should be the title. And I was like, are you okay with that? Because I know we already had planned on, we had already planned on recording, you know, She Wolf for the new yet, the as yet to be, un, you know, released new album, Trace of Stranger. I said, are you okay if we, you know, we call it She Dominates from the album because I know we already have a She Wolf on there as well. He's like, whatever, man. He's like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's cool. Actually, I like that. I, I always thought that was. I always observe that about those two songs. They're written around the same time. You're both mm-hmm. songwriters in the same band, so it's just kind of like it, when I think of it, I just think of it as like an answer. It's like almost like an answer song, um, right. in, in that sort of way, uh, but not not necessarily thematically. Right. Um, what about this? I, I, you know, this is something I never asked for, uh, you know, being around all you guys for, you know, and, and speaking to you about ha- however many topics that we spoke about. I, uh, the song Torn Prince, that was written by Jason and Steve kind of together and no, no, no separate. No. Separate, yeah. Um, Steve, Steve had written it first. Okay. Uh, his, his version. And then you know, when the deep dark EP sessions were coming around, Jason had approached him and said, Hey, look, you know, I really dig that song Torn Prince. Why don't we record a Mr. Monster version of it? I'll change, ah. I'll change the lyrics to fit more of my, you know, writing slash vocal style, but we'll keep like the song structure and the, you know, the, the end and the, you know, the choruses and all that kind of similar. And, Dude, honestly, like, especially now, you know, that one, the Mr. Monster version is hard for me to listen to now, mm. you know, given given the lyrical content, you know. Right. Of course. About, about a son dying, you know. Yeah. I can't, I can't do it. Like, I, yeah. I, I, I can't get I can't get through it now. Um, so but yeah, that, that they they I guess they kind of wrote it together because I mean, our version was already written and done you know um and they got around to recording the deep dark ep and that's when i believe again you know if my timeline is wrong joe help me out um 
And then it came time to then start recording the Deep Dark EP. And I think Jason had, you know, got in touch with Steve and was like, hey, you know, why don't we do a Mr. Monster version of Torn Prince? Because I really dig that song. Right. And, um, you know, I'd like to do like a, you know, Mr. Monster spin on it kind of thing. And um, Does Torn a, Prince come from 13 Ghosts? What's up? Torn Prince. Is that because when I heard the song Torn Prince and the lyrics and yada, 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 I was reminded of, is it, is it, was it the inspiration comes from the, the 13 Ghosts remake? Torn Prince, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah. Gotcha. It, Which makes it, sense for Jason. You know, you, I mean, it makes sense with Jason, you know, just kind of like the whole everything, not just that, you know, not just because of, you know, now, I just mean like, you know, because just, I don't know, just the, the, the greaser sort of aspect and yada, yeah. yada, yada. I don't know. It, it makes yeah, sense. It was all about, it was all about that, you know, for me, that, you know, character also stuck out in that remake because I'm like, holy crap, that could be like, you know, that looked like anybody like playing a Mr. Monster or anybody playing yeah. a Blink kid or whatever. So, you know, it's kind of cool. Um, yeah. So I think, yeah. I think that was definitely, definitely part of, part of his inspiration for it, you know, and that and the fact that he just really wanted to write a, uh, you know, almost kind of like a, like a fifties influenced song, but it almost is kind of like a, you know, like a like a what's the word like leader of the pack kind of thing you know right. like when they, so they have know. different lyrics i did not realize that so they do each version does have different lyrics yes yeah oh, did not know that did not yep. know that yeah um, there there are very there are very subtle differences it, mainly in the verses um a lot of the uh, a lot of the chorus lyrics of the bridge you know at the bridge parts or whatever or in the outro were similar, not completely different, but very similar as far as their wording. And then, um, you know, during the verses, Jason's Jason's lyrics are totally different to uh, to our version. Um, when you're, this is a kind of a a, a heavy, complicated question, but um, I'm sure you can riff on this. Where for you? And again, we probably spoke about this years ago. Where for you does how does songwriting begin? Is it always the same? Uh, does it start with a melody? Does it start with uh, music? Does it start with lyrical content? And hold on, that's like a triple compound question here. And also, are you the type of songwriter, would you say you're the type of songwriter that really tries, there's some songwriters, and I, this kind of annoys me a little bit, personally. There's some songwriters, I guess Mike, Mike, Fat Mike does it well. You know when Fat Mike like just writes about something, he's able to like pull a song from a topic and not the other way around. It's not like the song comes out and then fat right. Mike, makes the topic fit in the song. Fat right. Mike like, wills these songs to come into existence because he's thinking about something and he expresses himself right. in song format. I don't think that's you. No, You're more. No. That's yeah, a very, it's a very, uh, and I don't, I don't, I'm not hate, I'm not hating on this approach when I say this either, but, you know, making a song out of, you know, a topic or, you know, oh. what happened is very, um, very Randy Newman, you know, Randy Newman. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. A little bit, a little bit. You know, yeah. I mean, I he's very, he, cause he's very, you know, he's very descriptive about, you know, I was walking down the street and, you know, whatever. Yeah. And, <laughs> I think I think, uh, and I don't and I don't mean that as a, as a diss toward you know Fat Mike or no effects in any well, way. Fat Mike, but Fat Mike does it well. Fat he Mike, does. He does. Yeah. He kind of expands upon that whole like, oh, I'm going to talk about what's going on, but right. I'm going to you know, going to al allegorize it a little bit, right, um, right. But uh, or you know, metaphor, 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 metamorphosize it a little bit. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. He gets metaphorical about about it and stuff like that. So. A little, yeah, a little different than Randy Newman, but no, for me, I, I will normally, if I don't have a melody or like a riff in mind, then I'll write lyrics. Sometimes I'll have a riff or a melody and whatever, and then, but no lyrics. And, you know, so I'll write lyrics based upon the, you know, the, the riff or the melody that I have in my head. Um, and a lot of times Dude, I can't tell you how many times I've woken up at like two or three in the morning, you know, and gone, holy crap, that's, that's a great, 
I need to go like, you know, I need to write this down or document it somehow. So I don't forget it when I wake up. Right. Right. You know? um, but yeah, a lot of times for me, man, it's uh, especially now I, I write music first and then I write lyrics because I find that as I get older, lyrics, lyrics don't come to me as easily anymore. And I think it's because, you know, I, it's not, it's not a matter of, uh, well, I've said all I've had to say or anything like that. It's just, mm -hmm. um, it's just, as you get older, your experiences change, your, you right. know, how you, how you speak changes, which, affect, which affects, you know, how you write lyrics and how you, how you think changes and how you feel changes about things. So for me now, it's more of a, uh, I work, I work on a song structure most of the time and then I'll go, okay, what kind of vocal melody can go here? What kind of lyrics are going to work here? You know, for me, a lot of times it's, it's the vibe of the song. Like whether if it's, if it's heavy or, you know, like as far as like musically heavy, not emotionally, but if it's a heavier song, then those songs tend to be a little more simple lyrically, not as, uh, <clears throat> not as um, not as metaphorical, not as uh, you know, colorful language, not as poetic, almost I guess you'd say. But um, but the more like melancholy songs that I write tend to have a little bit more uh, a little bit more lyrical substance to them. Then they're not right. just they're not so cut and dry. They're I mean they're it's very simple language. You know, don't get me wrong. I'm not like I'm not. I don't write like William Shakespeare. Or, you know. Or, Shakespeare or Chaucer or anything like that with my lyrics never have. But um, the main thing I try to do, especially with those more like melancholy, somber sounding songs is I try to match the mood of what I feel like that song should be about or whatnot. So a lot of times, man, it's just, yeah, you, I start with a riff and then I try, try to write a vocal melody. Then I try to write lyrics. And then from there I decide what the song, you know, is going to be about or, you know, as I'm writing lyrics, I'll decide, okay, well, this song is making me feel like this. So it's, it's like a lot, a, it's just based on a lot of feeling, you know? It's, um, yeah, I was about to say, the way you say feeling, it's, I was going to say organic. It's a very organic process. And, um, you know, what's interesting. And here's my theory, uh, especially around your particular songwriting method. And I was going to say, I, that's why I went there with the fat Mike stuff. Cause I was like, I was like, I don't think this is how he, that's how he goes about it. I do know guys like that. And like I said, I think, I think it's a really forced way of writing a song. Now, mind you, for anybody who's lit watches this, I am not a musician. I cannot write any fucking songs. So fuck me. Right. Cause like, I can't, <laughs> even, I can't even carry a tune. Um, but with that said, fucking guy. Um, no, but what's interesting is, what's interesting is I think, or my theory for you in particular is, or not even just you, just in general, I think that much like with meditation, like when you meditate often enough, you train your brain to sort of operate in a certain way or, you know, operate certain different wavelengths. And I think it's the same thing with songwriting and song construction in the sense that like, I would agree, you know, yeah. You know, like you're you you get into a state of mind where, and I don't know if you believe in this. I believe in this to the nth degree. I believe in um, div divine inspiration, and I don't mean in a religious way, like in a way of like, you know, like the Greeks they believed in the muse, and the muse were were these these godlike, they're godlike or demigodlike or whatever the the um the Greeks the 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 higher power Greek you know, belief structure. And what they would do is they would inspire or they would use people as a channel for their sort of stuff. But in order yeah. for that to happen, I feel like a, a, an artist's brain has to be on that right kind of wavelength or get into that sort of place, like align their antenna to receive whatever kind of energy or and again, I'm not, I don't literally mean that there's some angel like touching someone's forehead and causing them to write a song. I just mean like, just in the sense that like, it's like if your brain is like a, like a mechanical puzzle, it's got to, you got to line up all the tumblers, you got to right. line up all the tumblers just right. And then all of a sudden you start thinking in a way that allows you to create these, these things. And it's often, you know, it's very similar with editing too, in the sense that what you're kind of doing, except it's the reverse with editing. You're building something from nothing. 
Yeah. Um, and an yeah. editor is taking a block of something and chipping it away until it resembles a shape. You're exactly. building that shape up. We're coming from it from two completely different ends. Yeah. And it's, um, it's a fat, the creative process is fascinating. It, really it, is. it is, you know, like sometimes, sometimes I'll agonize over a song for literally years and, you know, not to feel right about it. Like that, that happened recently. Actually, I just, I just uh, completed the new, uh, elaborate that on that a little bit more. And, uh, I just completed a new demo for an Aegon song, you know, that we're probably yeah. going to throw on our next album. And I wrote the music to it over a year ago. <laughs> and so, you know, cut to like, I don't know, two weeks ago, I finally wrote lyrics for it where I finally was like, okay, now I have a vocal exactly. melody in mind. Yeah. And so, so yeah. And like you said, I think it's just, you know, it's, it's bolts of lightning like that, that just hit you and you go, okay, now I get it. Now I can finish this or now I can, complete the complete the process or what have you so it's definitely it's it's absolutely like you said maybe not a religious experience or like you know religious related but it's definitely it could be. i think it's, it a, I think it's a divine i think it's absolutely a divine working of something you know yeah. like uh, let's you know it's the uh you know it's a light bulb that just goes off and you go okay that's what's going to make this song work you know um right yeah. right yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm very, I'm very fortunate to have to have those light bulbs, you know, because I guess the few yeah. of them that I've, the few of them that I've had, you know, people really seem to dig. So that's that's pretty cool. <laughs> now, now, let's say now. Let me ask you this. Now, what happens? And this is an interesting thing that happens to songwriters all the time. I don't know if this is a problem for you per se, or Steve, or you know, being in Blitzkid versus Aegon, yada yada yada. What happens is. You're in a band. You're in the band that 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 brings you uh, notoriety or whatever. The band breaks up or goes on hiatus or goes away for 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 some many years, and now you're trying to. And I'm not talking about Blitzkin in general. I'm think of a lot. I can think of a ton of bands like this, where it's like now you're trying to get back to that place you were at where you were writing like that in the first place. I think. Uh, you know, my, my favorite uncle who's not related to me, Glenn Danzig is a prime example of this where, you know, I don't think, you know, people speculate all the time. Nerds are like, you know, oh, I hope there's a new, da uh, who, no, please, do a new Misfits album. It's going to be really great. And I'm like, I don't think they can, I don't think it's possible because I think Glenn Danzig has to, the only way it would work is if Glenn Danzig uses songs from 1979 unused songs it's the only way he's going to be able to write a misfits record because otherwise it's just going to come out sounding like danzig and so my question to you is do you think is it within your ability that you can can you find that place again if you were to write music for a new blitzkid record yeah I, I, you know i, I know I, I know i answered that kind of quickly but um you know the one thing that i've discovered you know over the last two or three years as it were um three four years now um is that i kind of i kind of wanted to spend some time away from the whole genre of you know horror punk horror rock whatever as a whole because right i, I was just so burnt on it man um you know and didn't didn't yeah. hate it didn't you know i remember didn't hate it, <laughs> didn't, didn't hate it but was just done dude and like D done for the time being, you know, and I just, I just didn't want to be, you know, immersed in that anymore. Um, and now that I've, you know, now that Blitz Kid's back and I'm kind of re-immersing myself in that, um, I do think, I do think that it's going to be more difficult, you know, to, to, to write songs for Blitz Kid, for like, say a Blitz Kid album now versus, you know, back when, when we're in the thick of it and when we're, you know, when we're creative, when we're touring, when we're, you know, looking at each other 24 seven and, you know, the inspiration is there and we have this, you know, we have this purpose. It's us, us, us against the world kind of thing. And, um, you know, now we're older guys and, you know, we're just kind of like settling down and there's a comfort level in our lives. Now we're both very, you know, both very happy where we're at, but I think at the same time, like, you know, I'm still that I'm still that 24 year old dude. You know, back in the day that you know was was you know ready to 
ready to ready to like try to take over the world with Blitz Kid and stuff like that. And you know, and that, that's the other thing too that I think has changed is you know it went from taking over the world to to being well we've affected people and that's that's way cooler than taking over the world you know right and, uh, right you know I, <laughs> so it's just one of those things for me now where I'm like and I've thought about that too it's a good question I've thought about like well, can I, can I go, can I go back there? You know, kind of thing. Like, can I, can I harness that, that same energy and, you know, and I'm not trying to like downplay what we or any other, any other horror rock band does. It's just, but, you know, especially, but especially for us, like we've done it, we did it, we did it for so long, I should say, and we're doing it again now that I think it's, they're going to be kind of that worn, that, that kind of worn, but yet still comfortable pair of shoes that you put on. Right, you know what I mean the the kind of the kind of shoes that are like, man, I know I I should get rid of these, but God, they just feel so good. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're still so comfortable. Um, so I think that's that's kind of where I'm at with it. Is you know I I don't <clears throat> excuse me. And a big thing and a big thing that I do or I try not to do actually is I don't try to like plan songwriting. You know. Um, most of the time, I guarantee you, if, if, you know, we were to start writing a new record tomorrow, we just said, okay, we're gonna start writing a new record. You know, Steve would probably have a few songs stockpiled already, you know, that he hasn't used for anything. Me, he had, he had, I would have to, had me, I would have to kind of like, yeah, I would kind of have to like sit down and, you know, kind of get in that mode and, you know, would it be, in, but I wouldn't force it at the same time. Like, you know, if it was say, okay, we set a, we set a deadline. We say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna record in you know six months. We need to have thirteen songs ready in six months. You know, in that six months, I I may write six or seven songs, but they're not gonna come like you know within days of one another. They're gonna be there's gonna be weeks between them. You know, because right. if not if not months, you know, because I don't I don't try to force it. The minute you try to force force songwriting is the minute you write something. Unless it's unless it's a thing of where, you know, it's a deadline. Like I, I've I've noticed that I work okay under under like you know deadline pressure nowadays. Not so much back then, but now like I'm like okay, I need to write something for this. Um, now I do it. Now I do it fairly well. Um, is it my best work? Debatable. But um, I, the biggest thing that being in a gathering of none has also taught me because we're you know, in a situation where we're remote, where, you know, we're, we're across five states and um, it's just, you know, sending each other files on, you know, Google Drive or OneDrive or Dropbox or whatever. Yeah. It, you know, my, my, my first instincts with any songwriting that I do, be it for Blitz Kid back in the day or, you know, a gathering of none now is once I arrange a song and I demo it and it's, or I write it and I demo it and you know, whatever else it's done in my mind, you know, but now with, especially with gathering of none, I have four other dudes who are going, well, yeah, I mean, that's a cool looking skeleton, but right. Right. And it's why, don't we put some, why don't we put this fleshy part here and this part here and whatever else, you know, to, to kind of go full circle to the horror rock thing, you know, you have to build the monster. You don't have, you don't, you can't just go on a skeleton, you know, it, it's funny you bring up Monster, and this was one like one of the things when I was doing all the interviews and I was on tour with you guys. The, my thesis of the whole, of the whole, like you know, uh, of trying to find the core of Blitzkid and what makes Blitzkid, in addition to you guys being so accessible to the people, you know, the fans and the the your 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 audience and the people that that you visit from town to town. I think the other thing there's another level of that accessibility within, you know, just, you know, uh, kissing babies and shaking hands and whatnot. Right, right, right. And it is, it is, um, it is this concept of beauty and the beast. And it's this, all horror movies are, or I should say not all horror movies, but particularly all monster movies come from this dynamic of beauty and the beast. Beauty and the Beast is the very first monster film. And every you look at every theme 
in every one of the, you know, the from the silent era to, you know, universal through the 50s and 60s and 70s and yada, yada, yada. And it's the idea of the, the beauty, the beautiful girl and the, the, the monster who's monstrous on the outside, but superhuman on the inside. Yeah. And um, the unrequited love of beauty and the beast, which is the main conflict in the original story, is that like you know uh, that the beast wants to needs to be a beauty because he'll be destroyed if he doesn't have her or whatever. However, the hell that works, and um, and that Blitz Kid songs, a lot of them, not all of them, I can't can't blanket it, but a lot of them come from this place. And ultimately, what it is is that Blitz Kid songs are not about horror movies; they're actually kind of about humanity. Yeah. And they're about human feelings wrapped up in monstrous appearances. Yeah. And so yeah. in that way, that's why I do feel very confident that if you were to write Blitzkid songs today, because I think you still write that way, right? So it's just like yeah. like you would it's, you know, it's, it's not it's not yeah. as you know, it's not as centric as like, you know, Blitzkid lyrics are. You know, and not that, you know, even the last couple of records that we did, not those those weren't very, you know, boo spooky horror Ratchet. You know, lyric, lyrics either. You know, those were very, like you said, deal with a lot of human emotions and stuff like that. Just kind of, you know, metaphorical metaphorical uh awakening. Know, the awakening scenery, like scenery and stuff like that. Yep. Uh, but uh yeah, I, I feel like I feel like I feel like both of us do that so well that it's it's not going to be, you know, if we if we do decide, hey, we're going to do a new record or whatnot, I, I think it's going to be a situation of where we kind of already have our mo, and you know, it's what kind of what we do in our other projects as well. It's just we kind of have to go back to the Blitzkid headspace instead of you know the Rubbing Midnight right. headspace or the A Gathering of None headspace. And yeah, man, I think it's I think it'll be fine. You know, um, you know. Five Sellers Below is one of the saddest love songs I've ever heard. Yeah, you know, and that's absolutely what that song is. One of yeah. my that's probably that's pro, that's one of my favorite Blitzkid songs. It's a great that's a great Blitzkid track. It, it just um, uh, but that perfectly personifies what I was just talking about the theme of 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 all that sort of stuff. Uh oh, you're good, man. I just started wrapping. <laughs> I was gonna say TB decided he was gonna fall closed. And he uh, needs his privacy, folks. We want to give him his privacy in order to. Uh, but yeah, like you sort of see that, I kind of see that in, in, in songs like that. Yeah. And, um, you know, but I think that's what, I think that also is what gives you guys such the, the lasting power that you had. So what I, is. I agree. I agree. You know, um, I've, I, I would all, and, 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 and again, you know, it's like you said, you know, about the sound bites and stuff earlier, but I've often said that, you know, from way back in the day, like people have asked that question about, about our stuff a lot, you know, like, how do you, how do you wrap it up so neatly within the framework of, you know, making it about humanity, but still having that horror theme and scenery and imagery and, you know and i just and i've always said to people well you know humanity breeds way better monsters than any you know movie studio of course so, so you know that's the real scary shit real life you know <laughs> it's true man it, it's it is i think that's ridiculously true and i think that's why that so it's a combination of these things that lead to um that allow a band like Blitzkid to be as successful as it has. Now you guys, you guys came back, you, you did, you kind of very casual about it at first. Uh, you got to do me a favor though. You got to yeah, tilt your camera back. It was bothering me. Just an aesthetic thing that was bothering me to no end when you're better. Yeah, that's better. Thank you. It was bothering my OCD. Um, <laughs> no the, um, man. So COVID has totally thrown a monkey wrench at you guys. It's like, like crazy. Like yep. absolutely crazy. Do you think my prediction is that things will be back to normal mid twenty twenty two? What do you think? Oh do yeah, I don't think I don't think I don't think we're touring this year at all. Um, yeah, unfortunately, you know, because that's like that's going to be the third postponement 
<laughs> but you know, uh, my smart money is on no. Um, you know, I don't even. Everybody, oh well, you know, in the fall, in the fall, it'll be fine. I don't think so. <laughs> I, I don't think so. Um, it's a transitional year for all this stuff. Is. You know, it is. Yeah, for sure. So it's Sorry. not going. That's okay. Um, it's not. It's definitely not going to. I don't think it's going to to last in that kind of way. Let me ask you this question. Um, you know, it's funny. Joe was talking with Loki about backstage at Russia in Russia. What are you drinking there? What you got there? This is a uh, polar. This is one of the um, oh, the lemonades. Yeah, raspberry, raspberry pink lemonade polar. Yeah, gorgeous. I love that stuff, man. I had the they have the lime coconut variety that is phenomenal. I'll drink any seltzer too. I'm a seltzer head, man. Like I'm, it don't matter. You know, I'll drink Le, Le Croix, Le Croix. You know, I like bubbly. I like Pol Polar's probably my favorite, but um, I'll drink any old seltzer. As long as it's not just plain seltzer, plain seltzer is just so boring. So yeah. vanilla. But, you know, as, as, as you, as you found out, that's, that's, that's water in Europe a lot of times. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Speaking speaking of Europe, now we went to Russia. When I went to Russia with you guys, that was also your first time in Russia. Yep. And that was a very tense time for us at that moment because we weren't sure if we were going to get in okay because we looked like a touring rock band, you know, or with entourage, you know, and it was uh it was a very tense at that border. We didn't know what to expect. It was totally fine. Yeah, but at the time the the energy was tense because we didn't know if they were gonna how they, they're very strict. You need a special visa just to get into Russia. Yes, you know? yes, which I did not get until the literal eleventh hour. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy, man. It was it was a crazy situation. But you know yeah. what? The trip went very smooth. That that leg of the trip went very smooth and ended up being it very did. smooth. Um, you guys did the show. And, you know, it was funny, and it's amazing how you instantaneously forget about something until you see it on video. Joe was like, yeah, there's some behind-the-scenes footage. It was one of those kids in, in the backstage uh, green room that was filming me, filming you, yep. and I completely forgot about our inside joke. We did we did a, a guy that talks <laughs> – that. We did, the, we did the British rock guy who's been around yeah. the block a time or two and he's seen a lot yeah. of seen a lot of touring and he's been on the road a lot and he's just he's just a fucking wanker and he's just right. he's just so rock and roll. He's been on the road so much and just had, you know, tons of ladies and tons of birds. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. he's seen the road. He's seen the road. And I, I was I was cracking yeah, up. I mean, not to cut you off, but the impetus yeah, but, for my, my version of that character was yeah. the dude from Wayne's World 2. Mm. That's exactly who it was. He was the it was the roadie who separates the M&Ms, like the Van Halen thing. <laughs> exactly, um, exactly, exactly. He was, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And which is, by the way, I've been like dying to rewatch that uh movie in general and now that's just another reason to sort of steep myself in the but what was the name of the band you said it on the in the comments oh, on the I don't, I don't even remember that. I don't remember that I'll have to go check no. it I'll have to go check it but um I've uh, seen that footage it's funny <laughs> yeah it's dude it's hilarious because I and it's just like one of those things like you know it's amazing how speaking of like in the same breath as divine inspiration I also feel like there's a place where memories are just sitting and then the moment you it's like people you know when you haven't seen someone in forever and they're completely out of sight out of mind and then yeah. the moment you see them instantaneously it's like your brain like 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 synapses just explode like a like a like a patch of grass on a front lawn like yeah. everything grows really quickly and all of a sudden you are suddenly you're right back to that point in time Right, you're struck with, oh my God, that was a thing. And that was a moment for me where I was like, oh my God, we did that all through you know, Europe. And I don't know if we did it in America. I think we just did it in Europe. And um, that I think, was- I think so. I think so because we had, we, had, uh, we, had, we had started talking, you know, about how like we should do like a grizzled, a grizzled, you know, roadie right. rock and roll soldier guy while we're over in Europe, you know. Right, right. Yeah. And- um, 
and so we were doing that and yeah that was just that was a lot of fun that was a great you guys played a great show that night in russia it was a it was a tour de force uh set and we yeah we were stuck we were stuck what i'm thinking about right now is what joe said joe i was hearing everything from joe's point of view right um which was i think they were you and i shared a room they were in another room uh and um yeah, I remember being locked down in the hotel. We couldn't leave um, at night. And then we walked around. We walked around Russia and or Moscow. We, we went up the steps and pretended to be Rocky. Yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> uh, just for a few minutes, we were, we were kind of doing a Rocky Four thing. I think we were going to even do a sketch, and that didn't. then we didn't end up doing it. And uh, we ate at McDonald's right in uh, Red Square. And um, yeah, bought, that was bought some hats. Right, right. The hats, and they said, "Don't drink the street vodka because it will kill you." Yeah, and I was like, "I'm not drinking any vodka, but I'm definitely not <laughs> going to drink the street vodka in particular." So, no, I'm not the easy choice for me. Like, yeah, it was a very right, cool, you know, <laughs> um, street vodka. Got it, you know. And you know, it was even crazy back then in 2012 when, you know, which was not so far off from when in America, you know, smoking indoors. I know you can still smoke indoors in many places in America, but in many, 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 many places now, it's like smoking inside is like a, a distant memory, yeah. um, you know. And I remember we were in the Czech Republic and the smoke was so thick. I don't know how you guys sang that night. Because they were just smoking. I, I, I remember that. I remember that because yeah, that was a that was one of the smaller rooms we played on that tour too. And yeah, like <laughs> and I remember the stage not being like super high, you know, because most most places, guys, when we play when we play Europe or you know in the states too, most most places are you know at least like waist high. To most right. people, the stages are like waist high. To most people. this place was not. This was like, you know barely knee high stage, you know, yeah, kind of weird stage. and, and uh, <laughs> I just remember like in, in, in those situations, the, the, the people being so close to you as well, especially when they're smoking and like, you know, no, no disrespect to the European audiences at all, but man, you guys, <laughs> you guys are just like, <sighs> like, right yeah. face, you know, they don't get that. It's, you know, not necessarily a cool thing to do obviously because they're just having a cigarette they don't they don't think of it as oh i'm getting you know harmful cigarette smoke in this person's nose and their mouth and their lungs <laughs> you know it's like it's just what they do and i, and I get that but yeah at, at the same time you have like 30 40 people doing that right in front of you and then like nonchalantly blowing the smoke right in your face it's tough man it's tough to sing after you know through all that I can totally um, understand. It's not a diva thing when you know bands right. or artists ask for people not to smoke during the show or what. It's not, man. They're just trying to perfect. They're just trying to protect the instrument. What got them there, you know. And it's so, the instrument. You got to protect the instrument. You know. Exactly. Exactly. That's what Nick Cage. You know, Nick Cage calls his whole body an instrument because he's like an actor. So he's like my instrument. He's like my instrument. I'm like, I dig that. I really dig that. Uh, yeah. um, well, I wouldn't expect anything less of Nick Cage. Neither would I. Neither would I. Um, yeah, uh, Europe was a very different experience from awesome. America in so many ways. We went. We we really went. We mostly stayed in Germany. Which, if I have any big regret geographically from what we did in in Europe, and I'm really not complaining because we went all over. But I wish that we had kind of maybe gone out a little bit further in other places. But you know, that's where we were. You know, that's where you guys were booked. Um, so we mostly, we mostly stuck around in Germany, but we did, we went out to England. Everybody got sick. Yep. I'll never forget. You guys were in Wales, I think, mm -hmm. which I'm, yeah, you guys were in Wales. We were in Wales. And like, I literally, I think it was the only show I missed. I didn't record. That was the only show I didn't record because my voice was, um, I, I just couldn't, I was just like, I was dead. I was just so dead. I just stayed, and you know what's funny? I didn't have any tea bags. I was just drinking hot water, just yep. cups of hot water to like loosen my throat. It was, and you know what the thing is about England? It's just that damp, that yeah. damp gets in your bones, and you're just like, oh, yeah. you know, 
Yeah, yeah, that was bummer, cool. bummer. Bummer place to get sick in. I love, I love it, but it's yeah, it's not not fun being sick in in anywhere in the UK because it's just right. The, the air is different there, and you and you yeah. and you feel you feel it more for sure. You know, yeah, not a bad thing or anything. It's just yeah. you know, it, it's just it was just one of those one of those kinds of situations. Now, here's my question about Carnival. Do you remember? I don't know if you remember this. Do you remember it's 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 Blitz Kid, myself, um, Barb is with us, mm-hmm. and Marco. Yeah, we walk around. I got the camera out. I'm just filming the crowd. I'm not filming anyone in particular. And all of a sudden, this group of guys comes up to me and starts talking to me in German, and I have no idea what the fuck they're saying. Do you remember what? Do you remember this incident? Yes, I do. Those guys what? were. Um... Yeah, Those you finished. Were, the story. I'm curious to hear what you say. Well, from what I from what I recall, like those guys were all were like uh, were kind of like you know they had like a white supremacist vibe to them. They were Nazis. They were they were, yeah. they were some sort of yeah. Nazi. I don't know yeah. what it was. But they were and they, but they were very angry about you filming, and they didn't want to be on I, camera. Yeah. They were yeah yeah right right yes they, they didn't want to be they didn't want to be on camera, and they were just like yo, well you know in German. <laughs> they were just like, yo, you better put that camera down, you know. And I remember like we we actually one of I think either Marco or Marco and Marco and Ghouls or Marco and me or something. I don't remember it was two of us. I remember we came over, we're like, and Marco started conversing with them in German, like as right. like, that's know, what happened. It was like, Marco what's, and what, what, what's the problem, you know, yeah. kind of thing. And uh yeah. yeah. And then the, then the situation was kind of diffused, but like even as they were walking away, dude, they were stink eyeing us, and I was just like, "We're getting a fight." <laughs> you know, I'm like, well, "That's gonna happen." What was interesting about the whole situation was, I'm just, I'm literally like, you know, nonchalantly. It's not like I'm filming anybody. I'm filming everything. It's like the what? We're in the middle of a carnival, literally yeah. in the middle of a carnival, public yeah. place, public streets. And, but what was amazing was this guy's walking at me, he's speaking to me in German and he's grabbing for the camera yep. and I'm still recording going, get up. Like, what are you doing, bro? Like, get away from me. Like, just leave me alone. Like I'm not doing, you know? And what was funny was, I don't think I realized like that I was clearly, this guy was clearly in a gang and I yeah. believe it was either Barb or Marco who was, who noticed his, it was um, the dress because those guys, they don't dress. It's not like they're going to walk around with a swastika on themselves. They uh, they just wear, like if you wear a certain color of Adidas, track pants, that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, or like, or if you have you know, like, side. Yeah, like the Fred Perry shirts over here, you know, like whatever. Right, know? right, right. And so, but but I, I didn't even feel like, I didn't feel in danger. I was more baffled. Yeah. And confused as to why he was grabbing for the camera, and then that's when Marco and Barb were like, "You know, those guys are like that. Those guys are not to be messed with." And yada yada yada. Yeah. And you know what's funny? I have vo- I still have video of them. Like they they were on they were on video because they rushed at me before they were just part of the scenery. Right. But I guess again, you know, who knows what kind of nefarious activities they were into? They didn't want to be on tape, right. and then. Yada yada yada, and I, I get it. I totally get it. Um, but it was just like one of those things where it's just like, you know, yikes! Like, whoa. Yeah, you know? that was kind of that was kind of you know there there were that was one of the you know a lot a lot of yikes moments on those tours. But you know that's that's every tour. But that right. honestly, that was the first time like something like that had happened to us. You know, um, as far as oh, like really? being in Germany, yeah. We had never been encountered by like, you know, any any Nazi dudes, and you know, who were like, "Get out of here," kind of thing. You know, if they were, they didn't say it to us. You know, right? We didn't know, but yeah, right. that was that was pretty that was pretty blatant that day. They were they did not want us in their immediate vicinity at all. They were not happy. They were not happy. Um, and then there was the Hell Knights tour, and that was uh, that was very interesting because I had never been on a tour bus before, and we were on the tour bus, and you know, freaking, you'd done that before, right? You'd been on the tour bus, oh, several oh. times, yeah, yeah, several times. Well, you know, when we did when we did that particular Hell Knights tour, that was the uh, that was the 18th time we'd been to Europe, right? So yeah, 
Been so on, weird. been on the, uh, been on the, been on the tour buses quite a few times over there. I don't like yeah. them. You know, it was, uh, it, it was not something I would want to do, but I was glad. I'm glad that I can say qualify and say I've had that. Yeah, experience. It, it, it happened. <laughs> right. I could say I've had that experience. It was interesting to be a part of the, the package. You know, it's funny. I actually had um, Richie uh, mm-hmm. from Blood Sucking Zombies was on the show. We had a great time talking, uh, chatting it up and whatnot. Nice. Uh, he's doing very interesting things with music distribution that I think at a, you know, uh, niche level really make a lot of sense. And just, I don't know. I just think we're he's really on the ball about that stuff. And uh, it was cool to meet those guys, guys like that. Those guys, you know, specifically blood sucking zombies from outer space, they those guys have always seemed to be a kind of kind of ahead of the curve as far as, you know, what comes next. At least over in Europe, you know. Right. Like, they're all they've always been kind of like, you know, forefront kind of guys over there as far like them and the Crimson Ghosts and the other, you know. They're, uh, you know, that's, that's the, the, to me, that's like the holy, you know, trinity of, you know, uh, European horror rock bands. <laughs> the other, uh, well, the Crips and Ghosts are my favorite one, um, without a doubt. Um, Great bands. And then that's not, and you know, and that's not because I know Marco and Gozer and all those guys, but lo- lovable human beings, super Very. cool. You're not going to find any people cooler on the planet than Marco. Um, Marco is the man, truly the man. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, for, for me, musically, they, they hit all the right buttons for me. They're, they're fast, they're brutal, but yet they're melodic at the same time. And, you know, um, then the Bloodsucking Zombies, they have the whole, like, almost kind of, uh, almost kind of vaudevillian kind of yeah. vibe. Yeah. And they've changed yeah. everything since then. They've really, uh, yeah. so Richie is not a drummer anymore. I know, he, I know. That freaks me out when I, I saw a video of them recently and i'm like wait <laughs> i know <laughs> like, you know like i'm happy i'm happy that he's that they've evolved into this he's very happy with that and i'm happy for that too but i really did and i didn't say it to him at the time but i would totally have said it was just not the way the conversation was flowing um i totally loved and respected the way that they presented their band with their front man being this you know drummer who stands up and does the thing the way that they present themselves i just think it's really fun and yes they're vaudevillian but they're also they're they're yeah the vaudevillian is a great term i think and i'm trying to think of another term that's on the tip of my tongue they're like they're they're kind of um they're they're campy they're they're fun everything that they do is fun and it's not about like being scary or marilyn manson or any bullshit like that it's like it's just all about, um, uh, you know, songs like Dr. Frightstein or whatever and, you know, yeah. mo- Mutant Monster Boogie. and Exactly, exactly. You know, um, the, and their presentation is just is just top notch to me. And, you know, people can people can say what they want about, oh, make up this, make up that, blah, blah, blah. They're one of the bands that does it really well. And yeah. they, tie, they tie it in, you know, and it's it's not just – you know, it's not just a skull face or it's not just, you know, a blood splatter or, you know, whatever, which, which I've been guilty of, you know, right. Nothing. Um, oh, I see. Oh, I've seen pictures of you. <laughs> yes, you have. Um, uh, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but, so um, uh, what, what are some questions? Are we getting any questions? Like what's, what's going on uh, with that? You know what? Not There's really. Nobody cares. Mostly, just, mostly just comments. We got, Returns in Blitzkid, please. You and Gooseby. Um, Gooseby, not Goolsby, Gooseby. <laughs> um, uh, Nord- Nordeste Death from Brazil. Thank you, Nordeste Death. Very nice to see you. And he says, I remember Mary and Storm, my cry fall. And you know, I got to tell you, I think that's beautiful, man. I love the way that that um that this gentleman is using the english language it comes off as poetry it's like beautiful poetry man i love really, it you know like and, that, and that's and that's uh, but on the flip side too like and, and thank you thank you kind sir from brazil um we, we we appreciate and we love you too uh more than more than you know um like dude okay so 
you know, to put it into perspective, especially with everything that's going on in the world right now, and I, if you'll allow me this, you know, moment moment here, uh, and I got to wrap this up soon because my phone is dying. But uh, yeah, 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 we're, uh, we're, we're we're landing this airplane. Don't worry, I have to wake up in the morning for the <laughs> kid. <laughs> but um, but no, like literally, especially with everything that's going on in the world right now. To seriously, guys. From the bottom of my heart, speaking for myself, but I know, I know, I know, Goolsby would echo this as well. Thank you guys so much for, you know, loving us like you have over the last eight years now that we've been gone. And, you know, now it's funny because a lot of you guys who were with us at the beginning from 1997 now have kids of your own who are teenagers now and who are also into Blitz Kid. So it's, Thank you guys so much, man, because the biggest indicator for me is, you know, some other factors in as well. But I have been able to make my living off of Blitz Kid for 2020 and into 2021, you know, so I've never been able to do that in my life with music. So thank you guys, because it shows me that, you know, we did something cool that a lot of people really liked and. You're glad we're back and we're glad to be back. So I appreciate it. That's wonderful. And I really awesome, do hope man. that it's awesome, dude. Like, I, I do hope that you guys can um, salvage your situation too. with everything. And, you know, I, I really wouldn't, uh, I, I, man, it's such a shitty situation for, for all, all parties, for everybody, you know, it, it sucks. Is, you know, it it's not just us. Like it's, it's crappy for every band, you know, yeah. because no, that's what I mean. Yeah. Band, Every band, and not and not even just the band, not even the bands that do it for a living, but the, just the bands, just the guys who love music, like you know, the guys and girls who love music who just want to go play shows, the guys and girls who just want to go see shows. You know, it's right. like it, it sucks, man. You know, and yeah. yeah, I know, like I know down here by me, there have been some local shows and whatnot, but man, I'm not risking it right now, dude. As much as it sucks not yeah. to be there, I'm not risking it, dude. You know, and. Like because I would much rather be able, be able to be healthy and have full lung capacity whenever we are able to tour than to not be able to tour and you know because I'm dead, right? <laughs> you know, from COVID, right. it's not or, it's not worth it. No show is actually wor worth that. You know, no. um, that that you kind know, of I, risk. And it's funny early you know early on last year when everything first started happening around the you know mid March whatever. You know, we were still we were still slated to go on tour because at the time, you know, it wasn't it wasn't as serious a situation as it became. Well, you can't just turn on a dime with a tour. Right. A tour is a gigantuan thing yeah. that needs to be steered. You gotta, yeah. you know, uh, take a lot of calculations into play before you make such a shift. So I mean, that's understandable. You know, yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, we so we were still planning on going, right? Um, right, and. Uh, you know, I was kind of like, you know, well, I'd rather die with my boots on, you know, kind of attitude about it. But right, you know, then then like cases started ramping up, stuff started shutting down all over the U.S. And then you know, our booking agency got in touch with us, Dan, and uh, it's like, hey, Dan. not happening, dudes. <laughs> so we're just like, all right, you know, that sucks, but you know, hopefully we'll be able to, you know. Get, get back to it. So we were like, we were like, okay, we'll just reschedule it for October, November, thinking, okay, well, everything's going to be hopefully over by then. As right. we all know, that's not how it worked. <laughs> so, you know, here we are now. Um, so the plan for now is to go out April, May, which is in you know what month and a half. I I don't oh see that. Oh my god! Happening. Really? Wait, you're supposed to go out in April, May? Yeah, oh, I don't shit. see that happening. No, probably not. I'm sorry to say, probably not. Let me ask you this. Uh, we're going to wrap it up. Um, first of all, first of all, um, the the saddest part, one of the most tragic parts about our um, fi the final Blitzkid tour that we did, you know, at the time was the final Blitzkid tour. Was we had this tour manager named Chris Schaefer, who yes. was a seasoned, grizzled yes. tour manager. I mean, this guy had. Um, you know, seen it all, and he toured with uh, Adolescence and what were some other bands that just like a lot of punk bands like that, right? Yeah, um, like uh, what are the guys? Um, 
I forget their name now, but they they were a band. They were a band called Schlepp Rock, and he had he was he had tour managed for them. I think he had done a couple tours for the Damned. Damn, um, right. yeah, just a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Far, Season far, back. far, far from finished. You know, right. all those dudes. You know, um, he, he also had he had the first Eric Cartman tattoo, as far as anyone did. knows. He did, yeah. And he explained the the story in, in very abbreviated. The story is because if we don't tell the story then no one's going to know the story because right. uh, who, who would, who would know uh, from, from a dead man's tale uh, that Chris, Chris uh, saw the original videotape back in 92 before it was even on the air and got this Eric Cartman tattoo and had come to the conclusion without a doubt that he was the first one to have an Eric Cartman tattoo, which I thought was pretty remarkable. An expat who, really, really put his money where his mouth is. You hear it all the time. I'm going to leave the country. I'm going to leave the country because of politics. He really did. As soon as Bush became president, he was like that, you know, sort of like a radical punk rock kind of guy who was just like, I'm fucking out of here and moved. He to took off, man. Took off. He, really, yeah. he stuck by his guns and he lived in, you know, he was an expat who was a tour manager and just made his living that way. Knew a lot of stuff and would regale us with history tales in the yep. in the van. But here is the most interesting part, and it's fitting for the end of our conversation as we relived our 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 Blitz Kid excursion. Right. Um, he he told me, I don't know if he ever told you this, but he told me that he had a tattoo on his arm, and it was a Grim Reaper. And the Grim Reaper, it said, uh, to, he got it. It was to symbolize every time a tour would finish. Because much like you, Tracy, and much like, you know, your your constituents, you know, he too was a road dog, you know, pirate who lived lived for the road and lived on right. the road or lived and died by the road and, and his wares and whatnot. And um, he... He had gotten this this tattoo of the Grim Reaper with tours over to commemorate the idea that this this like this beautiful almost you know uh, secular religious experience because it wasn't actually religious so that's why I say it's secular but it was like like a very spiritual sort of like experience or like a heavy a meaningful that meaningful is the right word it was sure. a meaningful experience for the tour to be over and what he didn't know and what we didn't know what nobody knew was that at the end of the, as he's explained to this to me on the final blitz kid show was that in fact would be his very last show the yeah. tour really was over he died he 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 tragically died i believe it was carbon monoxide poisoning in his apartment in prague something like that he had a fiance and that was the end of chris but chris's ads, essence does live on in a variety of ways for that i'm grateful and uh, he was such a really nice guy. And really cool, uh, really cool man. Like I, I he was, he he and I he and I roomed together a lot on that tour, if you remember correctly, because we both were the snorers of the group, right? And uh, <laughs> but right. um, but yeah, man, we would we would talk like sometimes late into the mornings, almost till sunrise sometimes. And huh. uh, I know that. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's just one of those things where you know. You're winding down, and neither one of you can sleep, so you just kind of bullshit for a while, and you know that turns into like, oh my god, the sun's coming up, we got to be up in five hours, you know, or whatever. And uh, <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> we gelled. Um, yeah. No, um, Chris. Chris was a great dude, and uh, you know he had that kind of. It was so funny to me because it, it's it, it's such a chaotic lifestyle, you know that. But once you do it enough, once you do it enough, that chaos kind of becomes normal. Right. And that's kind of the, the vibe that I got from him. Like nothing phased him. <laughs> you know, he was just I, like, ah, I've seen nothing, all this before. You know what I mean? Nothing phased him. Even when, you know, I was bitching about Kim. I thought I was mad about what happened with Kim Necroman, that he wouldn't uh, he wouldn't give an interview. Yeah. And he was the guy who really put everything in perspective. He was like, well, how do you know what he was feeling that day? And I was like, what do you mean? It's like. He's like, you don't know what he was going through. You you spoke to a tour manager. You didn't speak to, you know, you don't know what the deal was. You went in there with one expectation and you, you come to the guy right after he gets off stage. You don't know what yeah. his state of mind was. And exactly. he was the type exactly. of guy who, who understood that stuff. He was also the type of guy who he, sometimes he would crash in the, in the Dodge. Um, sprinter. Sprinter. Thank you. 
yep. he would crash in the Dodge Sprinter to make sure the gear wasn't, you know, uh, stolen or whatever. He just, he was happy to do it and he was comfortable and um, taught us about a grilled cheese sandwich, but not the kind of grilled cheese sandwich you think. It's fried cheese, actually. Fried cheese sandwich from uh, Czech. Let me ask you this last thing. Do you remember what happened at the final meal before the show, the last show in Dusseldorf? At the final meal. Yeah, we were at that restaurant, we're at dinner, and we left. I'm drawing a blank, man. What happened? <laughs> uh, I don't something, know. something with um it was it had something to do with the bathroom i think i don't know that the waiter was being snooty with with us and so we we just abruptly left we got up and we left because the waiter was being snooty and the bathroom was was not functioning properly and and that was that was that and, oh. and that was the end yeah it was a crazy crazy situation um i don't and, remember that at all wow yeah <laughs> really somber. Normally, normally when 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 people talk with me, with me about stuff like you know, if, oh, I remember this. And if I don't like, if they start talking about it, it'll jog something, and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That I don't, I don't recall at all. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, I don't know. It was an interesting, interesting situation. But, um, but yeah, even, no, you know what? Even the the one. Okay, the one thing I do remember about that is that that even then, like. Even then, like Chris was like almost polite to the guy. Was just like, okay, well, you know, you know, we're gonna, we're just gonna leave. Thank you. You know, <laughs> was kind of pissed off, but you, and you could hear it in his voice, but it was still like just polite, and you know, was like really upset, but at the same time was just like, okay, well, we're just gonna leave. Thanks. You know, and uh, or that or something similar to that effect. But yeah, I do remember him being like, you know, sounding like. You could hear it in his voice that he was angry, but he was like still like being super polite and like again, just he's just like, oh, you know, when we get outside. And if I, if I again, if I recall correctly, I think he was just like we were all like pissed off because we're hungry and tired, you know. And he's just like, well, we'll just find somewhere else to go. No, but not a big deal, you know. We're all like we're all scowling. And, you, know. you know, one other, one last memory, one other memory. I remember when you know, um, I don't know for what do you did you have a show in particular that was your highlight of that of that European tour? Cause it might be different than what the highlight was for me in terms of like the best show. I, man, I think as far as like, as far as crowd reaction, I would have to say Russia was awesome. Right. But, you know, Leipzig, Leipzig was great too. I was going to say Leipzig. I think Leipzig was, well, I think it was the best shot show besides yeah. uh, the ghouls night out show. And I think it was one of the biggest shows. I mean, and I felt I remember the crowd being truly nuts. And it's not just because I've seen it on video so many times, right. but like I just remember it being a really that was a good that was a really really good show. You guys brought it that night, truly. We did, you know. And the and the thing is, is like I know people have got that on you know DVD and stuff now, yeah. or you know, and, and they can watch it on YouTube and stuff now as well, but. Like what they don't realize, dude, is I was fighting a cold during that show. I was starting oh, I think to get you sick. Mentioned that, yeah, yeah. I was starting. I was starting to get sick that day, and because uh, my voice is not, you know, what it normally is on that on that performance, and because uh, you notice on a couple of songs where I normally go high, I would just kind of go lower, you hmm. know, as far as like the vocal patterns and stuff like that, and that was just kind of like a preservation kind of thing. Right. Like, well, I don't want, I don't want to blow it out too. because we're going to show yeah. tomorrow. Yeah, you know, um, yep. and uh, but yeah, as far as like the energy and stuff, I think those two those two shows are pretty pretty much equal in my mind as far as like Russia and and Leipzig. But I think Leipzig. Now, what Leipzig, about throw Ghouls Night Out into there? Out of all the shows, out of all, if it was fifty five shows, um, do you think Ghouls Night Out was the single best show in the whole thing, or would you still say Russia uh, tops that? I would I would say Leipzig at least top schools night out because oh. I'll tell you why because because it was so fucking hot on stage I just right, felt like right. we weren't we weren't <laughs> we weren't performing like you know to the best of our abilities because we're all just like Jesus Christ like I remember at one point like I forget what song it was but you know we're in one of our little like you know 
jam moments where like you know ghouls and i like turn to face one another and we're just kind of like playing off of one another like yeah rock and roll yeah. you know, or whatever you know? yeah. <laughs> um, yes but like and, but instead of like you know doing that like he's got his t- he's got a towel on his head at this point you know because he's right, so right, yeah, right. and he just i just remember doing because i like you probably see it on, on you know in that footage or whatever um you know and I, I don't know some of that's on youtube now too but uh not, not from, not from the stuff that we shot, but I know other people have filmed some stuff. But, right. um, but I just remember him like looking at me, like I'm turned, I turn around and like you know, I've got, I've got sweat just you know raining off of me, and yeah. he, he just, he just looks at me, dude, during this little like you know quote unquote rock out moment between the two of us, and he just looks at me and he goes, "Dude, I'm fucking dying right now." Yeah, but one I was of those, like, I was like, I know, I know. You want to know something that was, but that show had Jason. Yeah. You guys did the new Frankenstein, and that was really nice. That was cool, and and the and I think it was. I think that's the best Nosferatu on the entire both tours. I mean, that Nosferatu was killer. I mean, who really. We, who do we have play bass on that? Was that Jason? Jason that played Jason, bass, on it, right? Jason played bass. And there was like a circle pit, but it was like a skanking circle. Pit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And remember. and Ghouls probably, be like probably, probably thanks in part to Ed Monahan. <laughs> but and, and Goolsby's out of breath, but he still musters the energy to go <gasps> you know, like, you know, like yeah. throwing it like baseball, like a baseball, like um you know, he kind of looked like in that moment was um uh, the guy from the bouncing souls does that a lot. He does the swinging yeah. thing with it. I really like that. That's like a cool swagger that Greg does from the Bouncing Souls. But. Yeah, 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 exactly. <sighs> um, I think, yeah, man. I think, I think those three shows probably on that on that tour were pretty good. Um, I like that. I, I, you know, um, you know, and, and honestly, like the Cologne, the Cologne, the Cologne show was good too because that was that that. Little did we know, much like much like with you know Chris Schaefer passing away after that tour, uh, little did we know that would be the last time we were going to play the Cologne Underground. Oh, the Halloween show, yes, yeah, yeah, because it's, it's no longer there. Right, right, it's sad, torn, torn right. down, man. Like so many of our great venues all yeah. over, not just the country but the world. That's like that to me was like the CBGBs of you know the capital city of Germany. You know, that's like that's that was now the yes. punk rock. That was the you, punk rock club, you know. Right. You just you just you just put that in perspective. And you know, even though it wasn't the best moment of the tour, I loved when we were in England and you're doing that goth festival with <laughs> Alien Sex Fiend. And you yep. guys at you guys just got such a kick out of them. Not in like a not in like a ragging on them kind of no, way. No, no, no. Kind of like it was just so funny because you're like, that's it. That's what they do. Bah, yeah. bah, 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 bah. <laughs> well, they, that that particular song, and, and and it's probably you know, forgive me, you know, it's like God, 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 God fans everywhere. I, I, I forgive me, like that's probably one of their biggest hits, you know. And I I, I don't know it. I'm not familiar with it. But literally, yeah, but literally, like that the song was the song was just literally like fucking twenty minutes of, doo, 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 you know, with the electronic drums, and then the guy just going bah, 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 like every couple of seconds. Out in trash, he's like, there's like a trash can that's turned over. He's like a cat, like digging yeah. through the trash. <laughs> like, oh, it's just like, yeah. what the fuck is going on right now? Yeah, I remember we did our own. We did our own alien sex queen song the next night. You know. Yes. <laughs> yes, you did at the pub. But wait no, a minute. No, disres- no disrespect to anyone who likes them, you know. All right, no, uh, <laughs> it was a fun. It was a fun parody. That's all it was. It was nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. Um, it was done in good humor. Wait, 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 wait. Why was your set cut at the Goth Festival? Your set was cut. It was. Um, I think because uh, somebody ran long before us. Oh, and so you know. And then, and then, and we, cause we went on, we went on right before Alien Sex Fiend, right? Yeah. Yeah. You were direct support for Alien Sex Fiend. That's right. Yeah. So, cause they headlined the night we played. Yeah. And I think somebody ran long before us. So we had to cut our set short. So right. we got like, we literally played for like maybe 25 minutes <laughs> where we're supposed right. to get like 
40, you know, and yeah. It might have even been shorter than that because they, I just remember, I think I remember like they were like, you got two more songs. Like, what? Like, yeah. we just started playing. Like, you know, like you were like, you, you, may, you may be right. I think we might have only gotten like maybe 10 or 11 songs out of that entire set. So it was, it was a That's very, fun. it was the shortest set by far. But it was fun, and it was fun going to the Abbey, you know, that Abbey, and we got fish and chips, and it was a quaint little town, Whitby, and oh, good times. Whitby, Whitby, Whitby was cool, man. I, I'd like to go back to that. That was a cool town. Um, listen, uh, let's wrap this up. We've reached two hours and 30 minutes. I like to round my shows off at exact pinpoints, so let's put a pin in it. But, you know, listen, anytime you want to come back, anytime we're we – bullshit sessions where you have a bunch of the guys on you should you know anytime you see Absolutely. that like, feel free to jump jump in the the shit show because we just have yeah. a we had such a good time doing that it was great to see you and and chat yeah, well, with you as well catch up with you guys with you absolutely man absolutely I, I you know i appreciate it and you know we'll do it again and uh you know next time we'll you know spin more yarns and about wrestling dude i was like oh, i wanted to ask tracy about rap because i honestly I don't understand wrestling at all. Like, I just don't get it. I don't fucking get it. I'll break that it. down for you next time. How's next that? Time. Next time we'll talk. <laughs> so that's, we'll that's, talk. That, could be, that could be another two and a half hour conversation. Oh, yeah, I know. I know. Like, <laughs> I just, you know it's funny. All you fucking guys and you're wrestling, and I just like, I just don't understand. But we'll, again, uh, for another day. Listen, yeah. thank you, everybody, so much for thank tuning you guys. in. Like, subscribe, share, leave a comment. Uh, Keep your keep your eyes peeled for some a gathering uh, of none, uh, maybe some new batches of hot sauce in the distant future, or, or check out you know um, the, the merch and whatnot, and keep your eyes. Gatheringofnone.bigcartel.com, a gathering right. of none uh, bandcamp uh, right. bandcamp.com. You know? So yeah, those, sure, are the, those are the plugs. <laughs> and make sure that if Blitzkid comes to your town, go see Blitzkid. Go, um, you'll have a great time. It's a good time at a Blitz Kid show. I can attest to that. So come see, come see Blitz Kid and let me know that you are not cool with me making fun of Alien Sex Feet. Yes, or get up on stage when Tracy starts singing She Dominates and just pull up. <laughs> I'm exactly. inviting you. Don't listen to Tracy. I'm inviting you and I'm saying it's okay. I'm giving you full permission. You just go up to Tracy and you start, you start whipping at his ankles or his back, whatever, while he's singing She Dominates and he'll be like, I need some pleasure with the brain. Exactly. And it will be exactly. uh, it will be really great. It'll, so it'll turn into it'll turn to a King Diamond type vocal very quickly. Exactly. <laughs> ah! uh, we have a, this is how we say goodbye on the show. We say peace and